Did you know, in SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom, the attack of the tubalit robot enemies changes when the game is played on specific holidays. On New Year's Day, they shoot rainbow-colored flames. On St. Patrick's Day, the fire is green. On April Fool's Day, the color is pink. On July 4th, the American Independence Day, they're red, white, and blue. And on Halloween, the flames are orange. Another interesting secret can be found in the Goo Lagoon level. One of the sandcastle sculptures at the edge of the level is a reference to a game console from the past. It's in the shape of an Atari 2600 controller. Battle for Bikini Bottom was created using the base of a previous game by developer Heavy Iron Studios, Scooby-Doo Night of a Hundred Frights. The Xbox version of Battle for Bikini Bottom even has the intro animation of Scooby-Doo left over in the game files. By searching through these hidden files, fans have also discovered a lot of content that was removed before the game was released. The robot SpongeBob boss has an unused phase where it fights Patrick using the anchor arms from one of the cutscenes. It was partially programmed and would have been defeated by Patrick throwing debris at the targets on its arms. It's possible SpongeBob himself was planned to use the anchor arms too. An unused texture called muscle arms can be found in the game's files, and it is attributed to Spongebob in the file name. The Smelly Sunday from the Season 2 episode Something Smells was originally planned to be a power-up as well. It's possible to hack the effects of the Sunday back into the game, and it allows Spongebob and Patrick to break stone tikis with their regular attack. The game's data also contains an unfinished dream sequence for Patrick in Spongebob's dream level. It's based on candy and food, and it has a few early assets like the tikis that differ from those in the final game. An entire robot boss fight was also cut from the game. Like Sandy, Patrick, and Spongebob, Squidward was also going to have his own robot boss. Concept art of the boss fight can be found in the movie theater, and it appears as though Spongebob would have fought the robot by pressing switches and dropping rocks on it. There are unused audio files relating to all boss characters buried in the data, but there are no references to Robot Squidward, which suggests it was cut early in development. The Game Boy Advance version of the game still includes the Robot Squidward boss fight in the final version. The SpongeBob SquarePants movie game has many interesting secrets as well. In the level Welcome to Planktopolis Minions, Heavy Iron Studios hid their best records for the time trial levels in a secret spot. A hidden alcove can be reached by heading to a high ledge that overlooks a lava pit across from two large plankton statues. Falling off the ledge next to the wall will lead players to a hidden spot where after a few moments a window will pop up displaying the time trial records. The developers included another reference to their studio in the Shell City Dead Ahead level. A license plate can be found among the piles of garbage that reads HVY IRN, an abbreviation of Heavy Iron. Another interesting fact about the game has to do with Patrick's underwear. Even though it's never seen in-game, fans have discovered the model for Patrick is clothed with fully textured Goofy Goober Tidy Whities under his shorts. Later in the game, when Spongebob and Patrick arrive on the beach and meet David Hasselhoff like they do in the movie, he's never actually referred to by name. This is likely because the publisher, THQ, lacked the licensing rights to use his name and likeness. Instead, the character just vaguely resembles David Hasselhoff. I'm not a lifeguard, but I play one on TV. Hooray! The line, I'm not a lifeguard, but I play one on TV, references Hasselhoff's role as a lifeguard on the TV drama Baywatch. The SpongeBob SquarePants movie game for PC used a different workaround for the licensing issues. Rather than referring to Hasselhoff's character as a lifeguard, he is instead treated as a mythical beast, and his name is censored with a dolphin noise. <laughs> Unlike the console versions, the PC version of the SpongeBob SquarePants movie game is a point-and-click adventure, and it also contains references to PC games from the past. During the fifth chapter, when SpongeBob tries to leave the bounds of the level and enter areas blocked by fog, he says, It's too foggy to see. I could get eaten by a Gru. This is a reference to Zork, the classic 1980 text-based adventure game. In Zork, if players tried to explore dark areas without a source of light, the game would Born, it's pitch black, you are likely to be eaten by a Gru. The SpongeBob SquarePants movie game was briefly available for the PlayStation 3 as a digital download under the PS2 Classics line. Unfortunately, this port was rushed and sloppy. The resolution was stuck on stretched, meaning players had to manually set the resolution every time they played. The audio and video would become desynchronized during cutscenes with delays of over a second between the animations and sound. You have got to try not to try this new Dot Broom game. Dot! Where? <laughs>
and there was noticeable input lag which caused problems during platforming and combat. The game was pulled off the PlayStation Store relatively soon after being released without an official explanation, but most gamers assumed it was due to the technical issues. SpongeBob SquarePants' first appearance in a major video game wasn't a game of his own, but in a kart racer called Nicktoons Racing. It was first released for the Game Boy Color, but subsequent versions came out for the Game Boy Advance and the original PlayStation. There was even a full-sized arcade version, complete with a chair in the shade of Nickelodeon Orange. Speaking of ensemble-style games, SpongeBob was cited by Super Smash Bros. creator Masahiro Sakurai to be a very popular request for a new playable fighter. Unfortunately, Sakurai shot down any hopes of the yellow sponge appearing in Nintendo's Brawler. In an interview, Sakurai mentioned the massive support for SpongeBob SpongeBob, but along with Goku from Dragon Ball, he said these multimedia characters are impossible to implement. The game SpongeBob SquarePants Creature from the Krusty Krab had a feature that was prevented from being added because of guidelines from the licensor. Andrew Oliver of Blitz Games had originally planned for the Wii version to have shooter style segments that used the Wii remote like a gun. Ultimately, the developers decided against it. Oliver explained, It's a cartoon license and Nickelodeon were uncomfortable with shooting. It's not that we could couldn't do it, but it added risk if we went down that route and were told it couldn't go in. When you're aiming for a launch title, you don't need to confront obvious approval worries. One SpongeBob SquarePants game was so flawed that it may have led to the closure of the studio that created it. SpongeBob SquarePants Revenge of the Flying Dutchman, developed by Big Sky Interactive, had generally poor reviews all around, but the PlayStation 2 version was particularly problematic. The game frequently froze on loading screens between different areas and it caused players to actually lose their save files. The poor quality and bugs may have been due to internal problems the studio faced during development. Big Sky Interactive was originally the American branch of a French company called Callisto Entertainment. While the studio was in the middle of creating another game based on a Nickelodeon franchise, Jimmy Neutron Boy Genius, their French parent company filed for bankruptcy. Having all the resources available to continue the operation on their own, the American branch split and became Big Sky Interactive. Soon after that, Big Sky heard that Nickelodeon was looking for a developer to bring SpongeBob to the PS2 and GameCube. Many members of Big Sky were huge fans of SpongeBob and the studio needed work, so they created a demo using the code from Jimmy Neutron. In an interview at E3 2002, Big Sky Interactive co-founder Matt Scabilia explained, A handful of people, mostly artists, took the technology we'd been working on and created a full working level of SpongeBob in two weeks, with gameplay, platforms, animations, a collection of items, and a working HUD. While the competition may have had a design doc or some models, we had a full playable demo working on the target target platform. They landed the contract and developed the game, but unfortunately, Revenge of the Flying Dutchman sold very poorly after the negative reception. The game was the last project by Big Sky Interactive, and Nickelodeon partnered with Heavy Iron Studios for future SpongeBob projects. Did you know? SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom has some unsavory words in its data. There's an unused file that would put SpongeBob into a level early in development named shit.plyr. The file doesn't tell the game where SpongeBob's textures are, so it loads SpongeBob as a blank, black object. Fans also found crude development text by emulating the game. If the game is run on the Dolphin emulator and the player loses all of their underwear, the game log will show decrement time equals zero, dash dash, ass saved. This, however, is nothing compared to the lewd content attached to the game SpongeBob Super Sponge. Super Sponge was made by Climax, a British game developer that closed down multiple branches in 2008. When these branches were cleaned out, the contents of their offices were sold off and bought by collectors. This included two backup disks of the development environment for Super Sponge, which contained all manner of game assets, design documents, and concept art. Among the game's concept art are three images titled Naughty 00, 01, and 02. These images depict SpongeBob performing an intimate act on Patrick, Patrick performing a similar act on Sandy, and SpongeBob in full bondage attire. Another folder contains art for the residents of Bikini Bottom. Files for two elderly residents are inappropriately named Old Bastard and Old B there's even a file within the backup titled Spongebob shitless.doc, where a seemingly disappointed developer criticizes many aspects of the game. 
They list everything that was unfinished at the time and present ways that each element should be implemented or improved. Other documents in the backup give an idea of the team's design philosophy. One document is called Overview of Yoshi's Island and breaks down the gameplay and variety of obstacles in Super Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island. It seems that Yoshi's Island somewhat inspired Super Sponge, and this breakdown was to help the team understand what a platformer needs. One folder in the backup has a selection of ROMs and emulators for the original Nintendo, Super Nintendo, and Sega Genesis. Most of the games are action titles and platformers which may have served as reference during development. There's also a directory in the backup titled Nickelodeon, which seems to be a collection of assets sent to the developers by Nick. Within it there's a folder that developers have sarcastically named New SpongeBob SquarePants Like We Care. Another directory contains several FMVs including a trailer for the Rugrats in Paris movie. It seems this trailer was planned to appear in the game in some form to promote the movie. It's unlikely the video is there to test playback of full motion video as a full FMV intro for the game had already been in the folder for six weeks before the Rugrats video had been added. Based on files in the backup, it seems the game was originally planned to have a much greater focus on 3D graphics. Many objects which have 3D models in the backup ended up appearing as 2D sprites in the final game. This includes Spongebob himself, who ended up as a pre-rendered stylized sprite in the final game, but appeared much more 3D in early builds. Speaking of 3D, there was also a rumor that a Nintendo 64 version of Super Sponge was in development at some point. However, the documents in the backup repeatedly mention PlayStation and Game Boy Advance and never mention the N64. For over five years, many SpongeBob fans were unable to play the Xbox Live Arcade game Underpants Slam. This is because the game was delisted from the Xbox Marketplace, making it impossible to play if it hadn't already been purchased and downloaded before January 7, 2013. Game preservationalists said Lost Media Wiki published a copy of the game in 2016, but a legitimate way to play the game wouldn't come around for another two years, when, in September 2018, the game was officially relisted on the Xbox Marketplace marketplace. Although the game was unavailable for several years, one SpongeBob game has been officially unavailable for an entire decade. SpongeBob SquarePants Saves the Krusty Krab 3D was a 3D platformer for the PC, distributed on Nick.com in 2002. In the game, the player would collect Krabby Patties as either SpongeBob, Patrick, or Squidward against the clock. The title became unavailable in 2009 when the Nick Arcade shut down. Preservationalists have since found a copy of the game and distributed it online, but it will likely never be released again in any official capacity. Several SpongeBob games have hidden or unused content. SpongeBob SquarePants Revenge of the Flying Dutchman for the GameCube was originally planned to connect to the Game Boy Advance version of the game. The GameCube game has unused audio that alludes to a Jellyfish Rodeo minigame that's also present in the GBA version, as well as a recording of the French narrator telling the player to connect the GBA or insert their GBA game pack. But if the player only had the GameCube game, they could still connect their GBA to view a mini-map showing treasure locations. In the Nintendo Wii version of SpongeBob's Boating Bash, there are 14 mugshots hidden in the game's data, presumably of the developer's faces. There's another selfie-styled photo of a developer in the Nintendo DS version of the game. While the Wii mugshots have clear reason to be there, the DS image appears to have been taken as a test of the DSi camera. The Nick.com web game Squidward Sizzle and Scare has a reference to the Game Grumps YouTube channel within its data. In the game's translation underscore en.xml file, there's a line of text that reads, Seven Asses. This is a reference to part 8 of the Game Grumps original Mega Man 7 Let's Play, where the Grumps joke that Mega Man gets seven asses. Other SpongeBob games have Easter eggs within the game itself. In SpongeBob SquarePants Creature from the Krusty Krab, there are small fish hidden throughout the game that the player cannot interact with. These fish are in fact a nod to Team Rockfish, who created the game's graphics. Another reference to them can be found in the cheat menu, where entering Rockfish will award the player 30,000 coins. Continuing the easter egg, Rockfish can be found throughout SpongeBob Atlantis SquarePants, which Rockfish also worked on. Other games also have references to SpongeBob, including the 2015 RPG Undertale. Undertale has many error messages within its data, some of which are attached to character dialogue. The character Burger Pants has an error message associated with them that seems to be a reference to the SpongeBob SquarePants movie. The line is, I'm a goofy goober, yeah, this error. Message. Did 
Did you know? Over the course of The Simpsons' 28 seasons, the show has lent its name to even more games. The first Simpsons game, Bar vs. the Space Mutants, was released in 1991 and closely resembles the plot of John Carpenter's 1988 film They Live. In the film, professional wrestler Rowdy Roddy Piper finds sunglasses that allow him to see aliens disguised as humans. Similar to They Live, Bart finds X-ray specs that reveal aliens disguised as humans. And just like in the film, Bart has to convince everyone that aliens exist. The game was released on many different platforms, including the NES, Atari ST, Sega Master System, and the Amiga. From July 1991 to September 1992, various Amiga bundles came with the cartoon classics, which included Bart vs. the Space Mutants. For the Amiga version of the game, Arc Developments wanted to make a new intro that better reflected the show's animation. Although each frame was sent to and edited by Simpsons creator Matt Groening, the animation still looked mediocre compared to the show. Another early entry was the Simpsons arcade game developed by Konami and tested by Konami of America near Chicago. Following the success of the 1989 Ninja Turtles arcade game, Konami took the Turtles' beat-em-up gameplay and applied it to The Simpsons. While there's plenty of familiar content in the game, fans noticed some stark difference from the show. While The Simpsons' family sounded like they did on TV, Mr. Burns and Smithers sounded nothing like their characters. This is because Harry Shearer, who voiced over 20 characters including Burns and Smithers, didn't voice any of the game's characters. This is most noticeable during the final boss fight. Welcome to your great Similarly, fans noticed a lack of another prominent voice, Hank Azaria. Azaria's absence meant that characters such as Moe and Otto were uncharacteristically quiet throughout the game. It's unknown whether their omission was due to availability, budget, or technical constraints. A gag that Konami included in the game were rabbits from Groening's first successful publication, Life in Hell. Published from 1977 to 2012, the comic strip involved anthropomorphic rabbits covering a wide range of themes. While some of the rabbits in the arcade games are enemies, there's another nod to the comic. If Mar is electrocuted, her skeletal silhouette has a pair of rabbit ears. According to Groening, he originally planned for Marge's hair to conceal a pair of large Life in Hell-esque rabbit ears. The ears were set to be revealed in Season 1's finale, but Groening decided to scrap the idea. Another interesting detail is that the Japanese game was notably easier than the international version. The usage of weapons was tweaked and the player's health could go past 100%. Even more surprising is the inclusion of arbitrarily placed atomic bombs, which only appear in the Japanese game. In February of 2012, both Xbox Live and PlayStation Network re-released The Simpsons arcade game. Unfortunately, the title was ultimately removed from both console stores and has not returned. In the early 90s, Bart's Nightmare was published on the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis to a lukewarm reception. The game's designer, Bill Williams, was a celebrated developer with several acclaimed titles under his belt. Williams suffered from cystic fibrosis and spent much of his time thinking of new ways to experience games. Although he started making out experimental indie games, Williams would eventually take an office job making license games and sculptured software. While working on Bart's Nightmare, Bill would constantly have to rework the game so it fit executive demands. These orders came from the management of his studio, the Simpsons license holders, and even Nintendo. Unhappy with the corporate environment of the industry, Williams walked away from the project when it was nearly completed. He quit the game industry and enrolled in the Lutheran School of Theology at Chicago. His goal was to become a pastor, help people, and gain a stronger connection with the world. Sadly though, Williams passed away at the age of 37 due to his condition. The show itself is well known for parodying pop culture, and this is true for The Simpsons games as well. One of the series' lesser known games, Virtual Springfield, has a secret mini game within the Quickie Mart. As a poo, the player must fight hoodlums using a broom, a shotgun, and an overpowered weapon. With its gibbs and presentation, the mini game is an obvious parody of Doom. Some of the games also reference movies. Krusty's Funhouse, for instance, has a password system, with most passwords being the names of Simpsons characters. In the title Super Nintendo version, however, one of the passwords is Joshua a reference to the Cold War hacking movie War Games. These parodies and references were taken to a new level in the 2000s. In 2005, EA acquired exclusive rights for the Simpsons license. The license acquisition was significant as it was the first time Fox ever agreed to a long-term exclusive Simpsons game deal. The Simpsons has always been known for its jabs at pop culture, but the new partnership gave rise to a plethora of possible game references. In an interview with Game Almighty, lead designer Greg Rizza stated that he was excited to parody and poke fun at the industry. Unfortunately, not all game developers approved of their properties being parodied though. During the 2007 Games Convention in Leipzig, 
Rockstar wasn't happy with Grand Theft scratchy posters being displayed while they showed off Grand Theft Auto 4. Rockstar ultimately asked EA to pull the posters down. In an interview with CVG, RZA commented, I was always under the impression that when you do a parody, it's a sign of respect. If we make fun of Grand Theft Auto, we're not doing it to hurt the sales of Grand Theft Auto. We've definitely had some reactions. We've had to pull stuff from the game. However, other companies like Harmonix and Capcom embraced parodies such as Sitar Hero and Mega Mole Man X. The developers used regular Simpson show writers Tim Long, Matt Selman, and Matt Warburton to create over 8,000 lines of dialogue for the game. RZA referred to the Simpsons game as the first playable season of The Simpsons. While the game was the best received in the franchise, things took a sharp turn when EA released The Simpsons Tapped Out. Shortly after the title was released, it was pulled from the iOS app store due to several problems. This included issues connecting to the servers, excessive bugs, and missing in-app purchases. As a freemium game, Tapped Out received criticism for its exploitative revenue structure and lack of gameplay. The phenomenon of freemium games led to them being mocked in a 2014 episode of South Park entitled Freemium Isn't Free, where the show's Terrence and Philip app bears an uncanny resemblance to the layout of Tapped Out. The episode reveals the cycle of enticing players to spend real money to buy in-game currency in order to avoid waiting. Did you know? The Simpsons Hit and Run was originally conceived as a direct sequel to Simpsons Road Rage. Road Rage was an homage to Sega's arcade game Crazy Taxi. Sega thought the game was more than an homage, however, and filed a lawsuit against Fox Interactive, Electronic Arts, and Radical Entertainment. When the time came to make a sequel to Road Rage, developers looked for inspiration in another popular game of the era, Grand Theft Auto 3. Associate producer on Hit and Run, Tim Ramage, told Did You Know Gaming, Grand Theft Auto 3 had just come out on console, and everyone was blown away by how deep and immersive that game was. The Simpsons universe was ripe for an expanded, explorative experience, driven by a deeper story and more character interaction. Since Radical had built the foundation of a decent driving game engine with Road Rage, GTA provided a blueprint for expanding the world and creating what would become Simpsons Hit and Run. One of the biggest similarities between GTA 3 and Simpsons Hit and Run was the amount of vehicles the players could commandeer. There are over 70 vehicles throughout the seven levels of the game. Hidden deep within the files of the game itself, users and modders have found additional unused vehicles like an ice cream truck, a blank blue van, and unusually an Audi TT. During a brainstorming session early in the game's development, someone came up with the idea of making the game open world. Executive producer of Hit and Run and Road Rage, John Melacquire, explained, During the meeting, someone said, Why can't we get out of the car and walk around Springfield. Though I don't remember who said it, I do remember looking around the room and seeing everybody's face with the look of, I wish I said that. We spent the next several hours discussing how could we do this with the current engine, and what types of game could we do if we decided to go down this path. When the ability to kick other characters was added to the game, many of the game's creators and playtesters tried it out by having Homer kick Marge. It was such a ridiculous thing to do in the context of the show that everybody seemed drawn to it. They made a rule though, no one could make Homer kick Marge in front of Matt Groening. But as John Melacquire explained, when Matt Groening first tried out the new kicking ability, the first thing he did was beat the crap out of Marge. Literally kicked her down the street from their house to the quickie mark. Though the makers of the game knew they had something special with Hit and Run, they assumed the game would receive lower ratings from critics. As Tim Ramage puts it, the team also figured that Hit and Run, regardless of the depth of content and how good the game was, would automatically be docked 1-2 to two points by reviewers because of the franchise's less than stellar history with games. For the game's release outside the United States, it received several edits due to objectionable content. Some examples are a clip of Apu saying, Hey, move it, Whitey! And one clip from the buzzer of the legitimate businessman social club that said, Don't come in here. We're making uh, sausage. Man sausages. Hit and Run has many cheats, including ways to bring up different character models and make changes to the way your car controls. By using some of these cheats, players have managed to access restricted areas of the game, uncovering unused game assets and strange glitches. Players can find many misplaced objects by using an unlock all car cheat to get the RC car and a honk to jump cheat to get out of bounds. Levels 1, 4, and 7, you can see variations of the Simpsons house in the middle of nowhere. This is presumably where the house is naturally located and the players would teleport to it. The house has parts missing because the fixed camera limits what the player can see and the missing parts are unnecessary. Characters can also be seen walking around in the out of bounds area, such as Lisa and Apu. Level 1 has two paintings in the Simpsons 
Simpson style, based on the work American Gothic. One idea is that they were planned for inside the Stonecutter's tunnel. In the final game, Simpson styled paintings of Mozart and the Mona Lisa can be seen in the tunnel instead. Users poking around the game's files have found tracks that refer to a land of chalk. One of these tracks is in the mission, There's Something About Monty. Though we never see a land of chocolate in Hit and Run, there is a land of chocolate level in the Simpsons game. Interestingly, parts of the Hit and Run track are played in the land of chocolate, despite the Simpsons game releasing four years after Hit and Run and having a different developer and publisher. This could mean that Hit and Run was planned to have a land of chocolate stage or mission as well. There are many Easter eggs in the game. If your system's internal clock is set to either October 31st, the last Thursday of November, or December 25th, the game's main menu will feature a Halloween, Thanksgiving, or Christmas theme. The characters in the game also frequently break the fourth wall, acknowledging that they're in a game. When Homer loses, he shouts, Oh, this video game sucks! This line was later referenced in Crash Tag Team Racing, also made by Radical Entertainment. The line can be heard from Pasadena Opossum after her cart gets destroyed. This game sucks! The Simpsons Hit and Run was voiced by the original cast of The Simpsons TV show, and the writers were heavily involved in the game's story. The voice actors recorded almost an entire season's worth of voice work for the game. Each actor voiced over 700 lines, and the writers were on hand to go over every plot point the creators came up with. At times, the creators would even get rewrites from the show's writing staff. John Mellacquire told us, The Simpsons TV team is always involved. They are from the start. They have to be. They approved everything. So for us, it was about getting Gracie Films and Matt on board. We knew we had achieved what we set out to. Then, to hear Matt Groening play the game and laugh, we knew we did right by the show as well. There's a strong modding community for Hit and Run, with multiple mods being published in 2015. The biggest modding project is by Donut Team, which is a complete reworking of the game. It has new levels, new playable characters, and new missions. Did you know? According to the original manual for Lego Island, the personalities of each main character are based on a theory about human intelligence. The theory of multiple intelligences was developed by Howard Gardner in the late 1970s and early 80s, and states that a person's IQ score is an inadequate way to measure intelligence. Gardner said different kinds of intelligence and people can excel in certain types, but not others. In Lego Island, Mama Bricolini represents musical intelligence, which relates to understanding and performing music. Pepper Roni represents logic mathematical intelligence. Papa Bricolini represents bodily kinesthetic intelligence, which refers to people such as dancers. Nick Brick represents spatial intelligence, which is helpful with things like architecture. Laura Brick represents interpersonal intelligence, which can be seen as someone's social capability. Lastly, the Brickster represents intrapersonal intelligence, which can be seen as someone who is self-aware or introspective. Wes Jenkins, creative director at Mindscape during LEGO Island's production, built a model of the game's island out of LEGO with his wife. This was done to help Jenkins visualize the island before modeling began. He laments not taking any good pictures of it as the island was tossed out after the game was finished. The origins of Lego Island can be traced back to 1996 when the Lego group invested around 2 million US dollars in video game development. The group wanted to make games featuring Lego supposedly because they viewed the games industry as a rising threat to the toy market. Lego Island was announced with the title Lego Town, which referenced the town line of Lego toys sold between 1978 and 1996. Lego Island had a few sour moments during production. Jenkins notes that the game's soundtrack was originally planned to be much more ambitious, with plans to feature music by Mark Mothersbaugh from Devo, The Doors keyboardist Ray Manzarek, and guitarist Dwayne Eddy. However, budget and administration fear squashed these plans. But by far the most unbelievable thing to occur during the development of Lego Island happened a day before the game's release. According to Jenkins, it was standard practice for developers to receive bonuses upon a product's release as a reward for a job well done. However, Mindscape fired the entire team a day before LEGO Island released in order to avoid paying these bonuses. LEGO Island has other secrets. On the second floor of the elevator, the player can see Nick Brick swimming through an ocean. This is a nod to the cancelled LEGO Island spin-off titled Beneath the Fantasy. In an interview, Jenkins said the game was canned because of supposed political reasons and went on to say Mindscape didn't
didn't realize the potential profits of the product. Some people from some unknown places seemed less than enthusiastic and were paranoid every step of the way. At one point, there were also plans for a LEGO TV series that would have centered around the pirate Captain Click from the pirate-themed LEGO set. According to Jenkins, the pilot followed Captain Click as he came to life and stole LEGO bricks that kids left out when they went to bed. The pilot was never picked up, but there were some speculation that linked it to the LEGO Island series. Due to the large amount of unused content within LEGO Island 2, the game may have been planned to tie into this TV series. This was also hinted at by Jenkins in an email to a fan where he implied the pirate cave was a sign of things to come and would lead into the next product. LEGO Island 2 also contains a hidden room, though this one is filled with LEGO minifigures of the development team. It's possible to find this area once the game is completed by typing S Dreams at a hidden alcove behind Space Mountain, where a portal will lead to the room. The code S Dreams is a shortened version of Silicon Dreams, the name of LEGO Island 2's developers. Perhaps after the sudden firing of the development team on the first LEGO Island, the programmers on its sequel wanted to make sure they were properly credited. Wes Jenkins was worried that he wouldn't get credit for his work on the sequel. Not only did he have a smaller role on the game and worked from home, he was also recovering from heart surgery. While Jenkins was vulnerable, another employee tried to take credit for his work. Jenkins said some weird guy at the company hired his girlfriend and I passed along my presentation to her. She presented it as her own work and then told the developers not to listen to me. I was in hospital again, so I could only grin and think, whatever. Other LEGO games had a more straightforward development. LEGO Racers started when High Voltage Software founder Kerry Ganofsky came up with the idea of a LEGO racing game where the player could build and race their own vehicles. Pre-production on the game lasted for over a year until LEGO executives greenlit the project. During this time, the team came up with dozens of ideas for power-ups, including a flying parrot and a sticky bubblegum weapon. The amount of power-ups was cut down based on whether or not they were unique, if they used actual LEGO pieces, and how fun or rewarding they were to use. The the of characters and levels were even harder to whittle down as the team had a giant library of LEGO themes to choose from. Documents and figures of practically every LEGO system character and model ever made were sent to high voltage for research. The team eventually settled on using four of the LEGO system themes, Castle, Space, Adventurers, and Pirates. This gave them a wide range of areas and characters to choose from. As well as selecting their favorite characters from the system themes, the team also created two original characters specifically for LEGO racers. The Rocket Racer and Veronica Voltage. Other racing games allowed players to tweak the stats of cars, but the team wanted players to build their own LEGO cars and do so with as much freedom as possible. They also wanted 3D car building to be simple and have brick placement and brick types affect car handling. This would mean cars that looked light or heavy would feel different on the track and give a visual indication of how they'd handle. The car bricks were chosen first by aesthetics and then analyzed to see if they'd fit the game's mechanics. Because of the massive possible combination of bricks, the team needed to come up with a way to optimize how the cars were rendered. Rendering each piece of a vehicle individually wouldn't be efficient, as the game would waste resources on bricks and polygons that aren't visible. To get around this, a custom mesh code was created that automatically welded the geometry of a car's bricks together once it was finished being built. This greatly reduced how many polygons would appear on screen. That said, high polygon versions of these meshes are also spawned for the menu screens and cinematics to maintain continuity throughout a playthrough. Altogether, it took over a a year to finalize car building in LEGO Racers. Did you know? Traveler's Tales tries to make sure that the vehicles and creatures in LEGO games are buildable with actual LEGO toys. When making art for the LEGO games, Traveler's Tales first searches a database of characters that have already been officially designed. If a model exists, they simply recreate it in their 3D modeling software. However, if a model does not exist yet, they must work with the LEGO company to make a 3D model that meets their standards. Traveler's Tales keeps an extensive library of actual physical LEGO pieces that they use to build models for their games. Charles McNair, model design director on LEGO Batman 3, explained in an interview with Game Informer that they test out their designs by building them in real life. Their goal is that if someone playing the game presses pause, they'll be able to recreate the models themselves with LEGO using only the game as a reference. The developers also work with the LEGO company to make sure that their newly created models appear as if they would be safe for children as if they were a real plastic toy. 
The LEGO games are filled with numerous comedic moments. Traveler's Tales injects humor into these games because they want them to be approachable to young players who might be unfamiliar with the often serious source material. The developer's hope is that these players will become interested in the franchises and go watch the original work. There's also an ongoing tradition in LEGO games where the credits have humorous nods to future titles. For example, in 2013's LEGO Marvel Super Heroes, there was a scene after the credits where an unknown figure leaps in front of the moon, creating a silhouette familiar to the bat signal. Although this hero is revealed to be Black Panther, this appears to have been a nod to Batman in a tease for Traveler's Tales' next game, LEGO Batman 3 Beyond Gotham. Beyond Gotham ends with a team of heroes resembling the Avengers exiting a portal, but they are revealed to be just a group of various DC characters. This was a tease for LEGO Marvel's Avengers. While working on comic book franchises, Traveler's Tales got to work with industry veterans such as Stan Lee. In an interview with the about LEGO Marvel's Avengers, Lee said that he likes doing voiceover work because it's like being an actor without having to really act. Earlier in that same interview, he also confessed that during his voiceover for LEGO Marvel's Avengers, he had trouble saying pew pew. He said that he didn't quite know how to say it. In the PlayStation Vita version of LEGO Lord of the Rings, there's an interaction where Legolas exclaims they're taking the hobbits to Isengard. If the player repeatedly uses this interaction, it will trigger an edited version of the line identical to how it was used in the 2005 viral remix by Erwin Beekfeld. Additionally, the PC and console versions of the game feature an achievement called Taking the Hobbits to Isengard, which requires the player to take at least one version of each of the playable hobbits to Isengard in the game. Traveler's Tales use the actual map of Middle-earth to guide their recreations of the areas seen in the films. Each location is in the correct place on the map in relation to the other areas in the game. During the cutscene at the end of the level Weathertop, the Matrix character Agent Smith can be seen behind Elrond. Both Smith and Elrond were played by Hugo Weaving. The LEGO Company partnered with Lucasfilm to create Star Wars-themed LEGO sets in the late 90s, but the idea to make a LEGO Star Wars game didn't come until 2002. TT Games director Tom Stone suggested they approach Lucasfilm about bringing the LEGO Star Wars subline into the realm of video games. This suggestion ultimately led to a pitch to Lucasfilm for the studio to make a LEGO game that covered the entire prequel trilogy in a release window for Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith. Traveler's Tales were surprised that Lucasfilm approved so many of their ideas, considering they were a small studio at the time. The LEGO Star Wars games were so successful that Traveler's Tales bought out LEGO's game development arm, forming TT Games, which would license the LEGO name. During Chapter 5 of Revenge of the Sith in LEGO Star Wars the video game, Obi-Wan and Yoda encounter a group of clone troopers disguised as Jedi outside of the Jedi Temple. This is based on a deleted scene in the movie. Interestingly, the game came out in March of 2005, while the Revenge of the Sith film came out in May of that same year. It's possible the developers were given a cut of the film to base the game on, which included this scene, but the scene was later cut for the theatrical release. There are several hidden secrets in the LEGO movie games. Santa Claus is hidden in LEGO Star Wars 2. If the code CL4U5H and TYH319 are entered into the game, it unlocks Santa's red hat clothes, and beard that can then be used in the character customizer. There are also numerous references to the Back to the Future franchise. Most interestingly, in LEGO Batman 2 DC Superheroes, the player can find one of the hidden mini kits by using magnetism on the clock in the City Hall level. When you do this, the hands on the clock rotate to 10.04 and lightning strikes. This is a reference to the scene at the end of the first Back to the Future movie where Doc diverts the lightning strike from the clock tower to the DeLorean at precisely 10.04 p.m. to allow Marty to return to the year 1985. In LEGO Batman 3 Beyond Gotham, if the player heads to Batman's trophy room in the Batcave and knocks down the cracked wall near the set for the 1960s Batman show, they'll find a hidden nod to the Riddler trophies from the Batman Arkham series. In LEGO Pirates of the Caribbean, there is a secret dancing Jack Sparrow character that can only be unlocked using the cheat code 
VDJ SPW. This character looks like the normal Jack Sparrow character, except he's constantly dancing and makes the other characters around him start dancing too. The code for LEGO Star Wars The Force Awakens includes assets for the character Matt the Radar Technician, who is Kylo Ren's alter ego from a Saturday Night Live skit. The character is now playable in the game and appears like it was removed late in development for legal reasons. There's an unused texture in LEGO Star Wars The Video Game that features a stained glass portrait of Dr. Neo Cortex from the Crash Bandicoot franchise. The texture is likely left over from Crash Bandicoot The Wrath of Cortex, which was developed by Traveler's Tales. Finally, the data of LEGO Indiana Jones 2 also features an unused graphic that reads, Your Mom, rated E for everyone. Did you know? Insomniac Games were presented with the opportunity to work alongside Marvel, but on the condition that they treat the project like a first-party PlayStation title. This offer was brought up by Sony's Connie Booth, a longtime executive producer and friend of the studio who'd been pitching to partner up with Marvel for quite some time. Insomniac CEO Ted Price told Game Informer, When Connie approached us with that opportunity, I started asking around here and in Insomniac and sent to various people, what do you think? We never worked on somebody else's IP before, is this something that would interest you? I expected people to say, eh, that's not what we do. But the reaction was, are you kidding? Of course we want to work with Marvel. Instead of forcing Insomniac to make a game for a specific IP, Marvel actually asked the studio which franchise they'd most want to work with. The studio almost instantly chose Spider-Man. Price said that one of the reasons was, One of our favorite aspects of game making is to inject humor into our games, and what's great about Spider-Man and Peter Parker is that they both have a great sense of humor. This element of humor can also be seen with the studio's last game, Sunset Overdrive. Interestingly, Spider-Man was actually built on the Sunset Overdrive game engine, albeit slightly modified. When drafting up the game's story, Insomniac didn't want to adapt the specific Spider-Man tale and instead chose to make their own. Co-writer Christos Gage said, We're doing our own thing. We don't have to worry about all the other stuff. Let's just do the best, most iconic Spider-Man story we can do. Christos went on to say that making their own story during development was liberating, as licensed games are usually tied to external projects and have to be linked to one another. The writing staff worked closely with Marvel's executive creative director, Bill Roseman, on the game's overall story and themes. Roseman suggested that the best Spider-Man stories revolved around the conflict between the life of Peter Parker and his alter ego. Thus, the writing team decided to set the game in Peter's turbulent early 20s. Lead writer John Paquette estimated that the team wrote upwards of 800,000 words for the game's script. However, just around half of that made it into the final game, as the team ruthlessly cut out any story element they felt wasn't working. Still, Paquette claims that the game's finalized script is equivalent to a 3,333-page novel. One aspect of the game's lengthy script can be attributed to the numerous one-liners the writers had to come up with. Gage compared writing for the game to his experience with comic books, saying, There are infinitely more one-liners. For example, there's a bit where Spider-Man jumps into a fight between two other factions that are his enemies, and they're fighting each other, and he says something to the effect of, Guys, I know how we can settle this. Dance off. Imagine coming up with 1,000 of those. However, for all that the writing team put into the game, Paquette lamented that no matter how hard he tried, Roseman absolutely refused to let Mary Jane or Spider-Man say the words BALLS under any circumstance, saying, For some reason, Bill always said, No, no, take that out. Insomniac's art team spent a great deal of effort rationalizing the design of their original Spidey suit. Art director Jacinda Chu revealed that the blue areas of the suit are supposed to give Spider-Man the most flexibility, featuring paneling similar to modern athletic sports gear. Meanwhile, the red areas are made of a thicker material for more reinforcement, and are a place where Spider-Man is most likely to get hit or scrape against buildings. Finally, the white on his gauntlets, feet, and chest is actually a flexible carbon fiber, perfect for landing and blocking blows in a fight. 
Speaking of combat, Insomniac didn't want the game to be just a simple brawler, and aimed to create a combat system that was more movement and ability driven, that didn't simply rely on combos. Moreover, the team tried to capture Spider-Man's improvisational style by encouraging players to experiment with his capabilities as well as the environment. Creative director Brian Intahar mentioned that the focus on combat experimentation ultimately made the game feel even more like a sandbox. Still, the team hoped the design philosophy and the game's progression system would allow players to feel like a hero right away, but would eventually go on to be an even greater one as they master the game, hence the game's tagline, Be Greater. Voice actor Yuri Lowenthal, known for such roles as Ben Tennyson from Ben 10 and Sasuke Uchiha of Naruto, didn't believe he'd be chosen to voice Spider-Man after experiencing some mild eternal resistance at Insomniac. Lowenthal explained in an interview, Everyone was like, well, he's done other stuff for us and we can't have him do Spider-Man because he just did the lead of Sunset Overdrive, and that's the guy he does and that's not Spider-Man. However, John Paquette defended the choice to have Lowenthal audition for the role by saying they wouldn't have brought him in if they didn't think he could do the job. Paquette's sentiments weren't misplaced either, as this wasn't Lowenthal's first time voicing Spidey. In fact, he'd been cast as the web slinger in games such as Marvel Pinball, Marvel Super Hero Squad, Online, Spider-Man Unlimited, and the mobile version of The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Nevertheless, Lowenthal didn't get his hopes up, assuming he'd get turned down in favor of somebody else. He was thrilled when he got the role, and has since called it his favorite game to work on since voicing the Prince in The Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time. The team's attention to detail can be seen in the voice acting. Multiple recordings were made for Spider-Man's dialogue, one in a regular tone of voice and one for when he's exerting himself while web-slinging. You said a mouthful, Doc. Take care. You said a mouthful, Doc. Take care. Although Insomniac Spider-Man presents an incredibly well-realized world, it did pull much of its foundations from early 3D Spider-Man games. Spider-Man on the PlayStation was developed by Neversoft and was made using the Tony Hawk Pro Skater engine. The game seems to acknowledge this as it contains billboards advertising Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2. If Spider-Man swings by one of these signs, he'll say, Tony Hawk, hey, I skated with that guy. Besides promoting Pro Skater 2, which came out a month after Spider-Man, this was also a nod to Spidey being a secret playable character in Tony Hawk 2. Vicarious Visions, Spider-Man 2 Enter Electro was a direct sequel to Neversoft's original title and arguably had a more interesting development period. Enter Electro was originally planned to release on September 18, 2001, just a week after the World Trade Center terrorist attacks of September 11th. The final sequence of the game originally took place on two towers which were implied to be the World Trade Center buildings, which would have certainly raised a few eyebrows. Due to this, the game's publisher Activision announced they'd be delaying the game a whole month out of respect for the 9-11 victims and their loved ones. However, the game was already completed before this announcement was made, and copies of the title leaked into circulation. This made it possible to compare the original and post-9-11 versions of the game. Four of the game's levels were renamed, with the most notable change of the top of the world being renamed to the best laid plans. This is the level that originally featured the two towers, but in the final game they were melded into one by a bridge. The game's ending and several other references to the towers were also changed. The multi-platform Spider-Man title based on the first movie, which was released in 2002, also had a few changes during and after production. Originally, actor Josh Keaton was brought in to voice the old webhead early in the game's life. However, Activision managed to get Tobey Maguire to sign on to the project a bit later. They then made the choice to put Toby front and center in the lead role, unfortunately replacing Keaton. It's not all bad, as they did make use of Keaton's talents elsewhere, as he was cast as Harry Osborn and was featured in the game's extensive New Game Plus mode where he controlled the Green Goblin. Keaton would then go on to voice Spider-Man in both the Spectacular Spider-Man TV series, Ultimate Spider-Man in Shattered Dimensions, and also played Electro in Spider-Man for the PS4. If the player enters the cheat code Girl Next Door, they can play as Mary Jane Watson. At the end of the game, where Spider-Man and Mary Jane usually kiss, Mary Jane will kiss herself. Having what is perceived as a lesbian kiss in an E-rated game caused a mild controversy, and Activision re-released the game without the cheat code. 
This isn't the only cheat-related secret in Spider-Man games. If the player enters Lad Neck in the 2000 Spider-Man game on PS1, they'll unlock Debug Mode. This is a reference to one of the game's main programmers, Kendall Harrison. Not only that, but if the player enters an incorrect phrase into the cheat menu, it will just simply reset. However, if you were to input a swear word as a cheat, Spider-Man will appear and just change it into something nice like flower, puppy, or spice. This is also true for the game's sequel Enter Electro. Both these early PlayStation 1 games also had a special What If mode that can only be accessed via cheats. This mode offers alternative takes of what could have been and features additional content. If the player enters this mode and goes into the waterfront warehouse level, they can find one of many easter eggs. In a crate near the start of the level, it's possible to find the Ark of the Covenant, a historical relic which is a central plot device in Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. More interesting references can be found in the 2004 Spider-Man 2 game. When the player has a showdown with Mysterio in a burning theater, about three minutes into the mission, the fishbowl-headed villain will utter which is the magical phrase Bruce Campbell's character Ash uses in Army of Darkness, another Sam Raimi movie. Later on in the same mission, a cutscene will trigger where Mysterio is leaving the theater and he'll say, You have no chance to survive. Make your time. This is a reference, of course, to the infamously bad English localization of the game Zero Ring, where the main villain, Katz, states, All your base are belong to us, you have no chance to survive, make your time. The Easter eggs and references continue on in Spider-Man for the PS4, as Insomniac went out of their way to stuff as many of them into the game as they could. For example, references to the Marvel Cinematic Universe can be found littered throughout New York City, such as Avengers Tower, located in the Upper East Side, Doctor Strange's Sanctum Santorum in Greenwich Village, Jessica Jones's alias Investigations, and the Murdoch and Nelson Law Firm in Hell's Kitchen, a statue of Lockjaw from Inhumans in the Financial District, and many more. Although far more subtle, there are also references to even older Marvel movies as well. At one point in the game, Spider-Man tries to stop a runaway subway train, just like Tobey Maguire did in 2004's Spider-Man 2. However, when his web line snaps, Spidey quips, that totally worked last time, directly referring to the iconic scene from Sam Raimi's movie. Did you know? Acclaim acquired the license to make South Park games before the first season of the show had even finished airing. Because the show was unproven at this point, the company acquired the license for a very small sum of money. The show quickly became popular, and by March 1998, Acclaim decided to capitalize on the show's success. One of the first publications to talk about the upcoming South Park games was CNET's GameCenter.com. GameCenter reported on South Park for the Nintendo 64, which eventually released, as well as two other games that were cancelled. The first game was South Park for the Game Boy, and the other was a point-and-click adventure game titled A Week in South Park. A Week in South Park was planned to release for the PlayStation and PC, specifically so it could use CD-quality music and voice acting. It was being developed by Dreamforge Entertainment, who had previously made the award-winning point-and-click title Sanitarium. The game was reportedly puzzle-heavy, and focused on using Cartman, Stan, Kyle, and Kenny cooperatively to solve problems. The game would have emulated the show's art style, and have over 40 hours of gameplay across seven episodes. A Week in South Park was apparently 15% finished during the Game Center report, but it was never mentioned again. One of Acclaim's biggest problems starting out was that they wanted their first South Park game ready for Christmas 1998, which meant South Park for the N64 had to be ready for printing in just half a year. Due to the heavy time constraints, developers couldn't create a new engine for the project, and needed to use whatever they had at the time. The only viable engine they had was the Turok engine, which would also dictate the game's genre as a first-person shooter. Only Season 1 of the show was finished during this period, which limited what the team could reference. Season 1 included the episode Volcano, where Stan's Uncle Jimbo takes the boys hunting. This was the team's starting point to brainstorm ideas. They decided to make a proof of concept by creating a fast Quake mod with custom art so that they could get approval from Comedy Central. The team recorded a video of themselves as the four main boys, running around the playground and football field outside South Park Elementary, attacking each other with Quake weaponry and gore. 
They sent the video to Comedy Central, expecting swift approval. However, between the time the video was sent and received, a school in Arkansas was attacked. Lead artist Peyton Duncan told Did You Know Gaming, Needless to say, the idea of Eric, Stan, Kyle, and Kenny jibbing each other on the playground had a completely different reaction at that point than what we originally intended. Understandably, Comedy Central did not approve the proof of concept. In the aftermath, the team scrambled to come up with a way to salvage the project. They came up with the idea of substituting firearms for mischievous gadgets and toys that the boys could hit each other with. Comedy Central and South Park creators Matt Stone and Trey Parker apparently loved the team's idea and gave them approval for the concept. Once the game was approved for full development, the team were briefed that production would be constant overtime and effectively six entire months of crunch. Every member of the team knew the stakes and agreed to stay. Some parts of the game were under incredible constraints, with musician Darren Mitchell finishing his score for the title in just three weeks. Lead designer and project manager Neil Glancy would fly constantly between the development studio in Austin, Texas, Comedy Central in New York, and Matt and Trey in Los Angeles to get feedback on the game. According to Glancy, Matt and Trey were fairly involved with the game's development, giving feedback and contributing ideas as well as their voices to the game. However, Matt and Trey have insisted they had little to do with the production of any South Park games before The Stick of Truth. This could be an effort to distance themselves from the product, influenced by their negative experience with South Park games as a whole. This theory is backed up by comments made by Trey Parker at the PlayStation 2 premiere that seem to specifically lampoon South Park Rally. Parker said, It's been really hard. We have no control over it, you know? And they just put these games out and it's like racing cars and all this stuff. And we're just like, that's stupid, you know? That said, Matt and Trey have criticized the original South Park game's liberal use of turkeys in their DVD commentary of the episode Starvin' Marvin. The original South Park game was planned to have multiplayer modes such as Capture the Flag, Grudge Match, Kick the Baby, and Deathmatch. But the final game only ended up having Deathmatch. Another feature that was cut from multiplayer was a third-person camera, which was intended to let players see more of their own character. Interestingly, the game was originally going to include the character Scuzzlebutt from the Volcano episode of the show. Acclaim couldn't implement the character, however, due to the legal issues of his leg being American actor Patrick Duffy. The game also originally went by the title South Park Deeply Impacted, a name that was chosen to give an indication of the game's story and because it sounded naughty. Although the game had a troubled development, it was completed on time. Because of the strict time constraints of production, Acclaim air freighted the N64 cartridges in from Asia so that they'd be on store shelves in time for Christmas. This was expensive and unusual at the time, with most games being shipped by sea. An advertisement in Nintendo Power issue 114 reiterated that South Park would still be releasing for the Game Boy as well as the N64. Later in the same issue, Nintendo Power shared the only public screenshot of the game known to exist. The title was being developed at the same time as the N64 game by a different team, but was scrapped. As stated by Unseen64, the game was apparently canned due to Matt and Trey's beliefs about the Game Boy brand. The duo thought the Game Boy was heavily geared towards children, and that South Park wasn't a good fit for the platform due to its adult nature. Although the game was cancelled and seemed to be gone forever, a ROM dump of South Park was published online in August 2018 at the Lost Media Wiki. The game has different story elements to the N64 title, and its gameplay takes the form of a puzzle platformer. Though it never saw commercial release, the game lived on in other ways. It appears to have been repurposed into both the new adventures of Mary-Kate and Ashley in North America and Maya the Bee and her friends in Europe. The similarities between these two games are clear, but Maya the Bee in particular has a strong connection to the Game Boy prototype. Not only are all the passwords for levels the same in both games, but Maya the Bee even has leftover sprites of Kenny, Cartman, Kyle, and Stan in its data. Funnily enough, Maya the Bee was then repurposed into another Game Boy Mary-Kate and Ashley game a year later. Although the original South Park game had received mixed reviews, the first South Park game to be outright panned was South Park Rally. The game was developed by Tantalus Media, who'd made a name for themselves working on a handful of noteworthy ports for the Sega Saturn. However, it seems that single-handedly developing the Nintendo 64, PlayStation 1, and PC versions of Rally in just seven months stretched the studio too thin. 
The failure of Rally hit Tantalus hard, and the studio would have to constantly work on small projects to keep themselves afloat. Tantalus's luck would eventually change as they went on to develop Twilight Princess HD for the Wii U and help port Sonic Mania to the Nintendo Switch. Although Rally had a short development period, it has a surprising amount of cut content. All versions of the game reference unused characters. The N64 version mentions Miss Crabtree, the PlayStation game also references Chicken Lover, and the Dreamcast game mentions both characters as well as a clown. Through some modifications, all three of these characters are actually playable in the game's PC release, and even have some voice files attached to them. Between all versions, several unused items are also mentioned, including Fat Abbott, a football, the Triangle of Zinthar, Santa, and Ike Brofloski. Kenny's dad was also planned to drive around in a roadkill-stained truck, but this seems to have been a stage hazard cut early in development. The initial run of South Park games clearly disappointed Matt and Trey, and soured the idea of creating South Park games for them. Up until the release of the Stick of Truth, the South Park license was barely touched at all after Rally. However, this could have been very different. After a claim went out of business, Ubisoft picked up the license to make South Park games. They soon began looking for a development studio that could put together a prototype, and found BuzzMonkey software. BuzzMonkey had shown test demos to Ubisoft in the past, who were impressed with BuzzMonkey's technical expertise. Ubisoft gave the team approval to start development on an open-world South Park game inspired by The Simpsons' Hit and Run. The team wanted it to be more of an open-world adventure game, however, with less of a focus on vehicular missions than Hit and Run. It would have focused on puzzle-solving and interactive gags that were scattered across the map. Development started in December 2004, around the same time as Season 8 of the show was wrapping up. The game was being developed for the PlayStation 2, but was also being made for Xbox, with a GameCube version planned in the future. Although the game had voice samples, Matt and Trey didn't contribute any of them, and the duo were barely aware of the game's development. Cartman, Stan, Kyle, and Kenny were all planned to be playable, as well as Chef, Randy Marsh, Gerald Brofloski, Mr. Slave, and Towley. Towards the end of development, the team experimented with having the four main boys in play at the same time, with the player directly controlling one of them but being able to switch to another one on the fly. Split-screen multiplayer modes were also planned and partially implemented, but the focus was on the single player during production. As the game started to come together, it became apparent that it was trying to do too much. Game developer Marshall Gores, who actually worked on the original N64 South Park game, was brought in to help refocus the project. The team tried to get things back on schedule, but less than a month later, the project was cancelled after 10 months of development. As well as a lack of focus, the project may have been cancelled due to the actions of one of the producers. Gores told VentureBeat, I think ultimately the publisher really didn't know what they wanted it to be, and we kind of suffered from having an overactive, over-involved producer. He used to call people late at night and bug them about things and was constantly coming up with new brainstorms. I think he was trying to please several masters. Did you know? The Stick of Truth actually started with what developers Obsidian Entertainment thought would be a prank phone call. South Park creators Trey Parker and Matt Stone wanted to make a proper South Park game where they were heavily involved, and Obsidian was at the top of their list. Obsidian was surprised with how interested Parker and Stone were, especially after Parker surprised them with his extensive knowledge about Obsidian's games like Fallout New Vegas. Parker and Stone's company even financed the Stick of Truth from the very beginning. The final size of the Stick of Truth's team maxed out at around 50 people. New New artists had to be hired, as many of Obsidian's artists preferred to work in three dimensions. One of the initial ideas for the Stick of Truth was to make the player sneak past people's home security systems. Parker and Stone mentioned this during the commentary for the Season 16 episode, Insecurity. The episode in question mocks security systems and was actually inspired by this unused game mechanic. Another way that the game has impacted the series is that, before the Stick of Truth, there was no concrete map of the town. Stone and Parker are both huge fans of RPGs, and have several favourites that inspired the Stick of Truth's creation. This includes Skyrim, Paper Mario, Earthbound, and The Legend of Zelda. The duo also said that Paper Mario's visuals influenced the Stick of Truth's look, and that they loved the feeling of Earthbound, particularly how the game gave you control of a kid in a big world where something larger than initially perceived unfolds. The new kid, being a silent protagonist, was somewhat inspired by Link from the Zelda series. Matt and Trey underestimated how complicated making an RPG would be. During a Comic Con 2013 panel, Parker said, I really love playing Skyrim, as many people did, so I was like, Let's do this, this is easy. 
Their ambition got the better of them, and they ended up writing a script that was over 850 pages long. Based on Stones and Parker's aspirations for the game, both the South Park team and developer Obsidian jokingly predicted the game would release sometime in the year 2032. Parker and Stone were urged to cut a sizable amount of the script out and include some of it in future downloadable content. Parker and Stone were extremely against this idea, and instead hoped to use leftover content in future episodes of the show. In the end, though, some fairly notable chunks of the game were cut out. A fight against vampire kids was planned to take place in a church and cemetery, and hippies were also planned to appear as enemies. There were plans to include a giant underground kingdom for both the underpants gnomes and crab people, showing that the two species were at odds with each other. There's still a memorable scene involving gnomes in the final game, but there's only a single crab person that lives in the sewers. There are even plans to create an entire town based on Christmas. Mr. Hankey would reside there, but his home was ultimately downgraded to a tiny house in the sewers, and a giant monkey dragon was planned to appear as a boss. There was also an entire mission involving ginger kids. They would have stolen Cartman's precious doll, Polly Prissy Pants, prompting Cartman to send the new kid on a quest to retrieve her. There was at least one other cut side quest involving Bebe and the Fortune Catcher. Earlier versions of the game also included five playable classes, Paladin, Wizard, Rogue, Adventurer, and Jew. The final types ended up being Fighter, Thief, Mage, and Jew. In the game's code, there's an unused Cleric class, which may have replaced the Paladin later in development before they cut it entirely. The Stick of Truth's costumes were taken from the 2002 South Park episode The Return of the Fellowship of the Ring to the Two Towers. The episode featured all boys dressing up as characters from the Lord of the Rings universe, with several key events and characters mixed into the narrative. At first, Obsidian created ornate fantasy armors, weapons, and items for the game. Parker and Stone asked Obsidian to scrap the assets and make something that looked much crappier. The duo wanted any equipment to look poorly constructed, so it seemed like they were made by children. South Park Studios also provided Obsidian with full access to the show's archives and art Assets. This allowed the developer to include unused Ching Pokemon designs that never made it into any episodes. The Stick of Truth was originally going to be published by THQ, however, THQ went bankrupt during the game's development, and the publishing rights were sold to Ubisoft. South Park's creators didn't know about THQ's situation until they heard it in the news, and were apparently excited when they found out Ubisoft had picked up the rights to the game. Matt and Trey wanted to make sure the show's controversial comedy made it into the game. Stick of Truth's creative consultant, Jordan Thomas, was adamant about giving Parker and Stone as much freedom as possible. Tom Thomas told Destructoid, The way we looked at humour was, if a moment was a hot button for the audience, should we make it worse? Because Parker and Stone love to push boundaries, and their default response was definitely not to back down. But the really healthy counterbalance was, can we make it funnier? And the answer was often yes. It was definitely the right amount of pressure. The final North American version included plenty of adult humour, crazy scenes, and moments you'd expect from South Park. But it was the only version of the game that went completely uncensored. Ubisoft decided to censor the PS3 and Xbox 360 versions of the game in multiple locations around the world. The publisher voluntarily blocked out six scenes, calling it a market decision made by Ubisoft EMA. The German version was specifically censored because of the use of swastikas, Nazis, and other Hitler-related imagery. When Parker and Stone found out about this, they decided to insert placeholder images in order to mock the changes. The European versions had certain sections replaced by an image of a disapproving statue with an explicit description of the events that were happening. The placeholder in the Australian version was similar, but featured a koala crying instead of the statue. The leader of Obsidian Entertainment, Fergus Urquhart recalled the first time he watched the alien probing scene the evening before a meeting with Parker and Stone. Urquhart ultimately thought the scene was funny, but he knew he'd have to talk about it with Matt and Trey, especially when his wife called the scene atrocious. Urquhart told Eurogamer, I'll be honest, for me that scene is funny as hell, but then it's hard for me to judge other people and whether they feel it should be in a game or not. That's really hard for me. The decision to censor the game was out of Obsidian's hands and ultimately down to Ubisoft, but Urquhart did say he would have stuck his neck out if the censorships would have gone too far, saying, at some point, if the censorship had gone to even more of an extreme, and particularly if there wasn't a PC version, then I would have gotten more involved, as to say, this is getting ridiculous. Although a lot of the development period was hectic, there were some humorous moments. When Matt and Trey got excited about a quest in meetings, they'd break into character and start improvising dialogue in the kids' voices. Obsidian creative director Chris Avalone said, Suddenly there'll be Cartman talking about the quest, and they'll be funny about it. You sit back and let them go, and you're like, now I understand how funny this area is going to be.
Did you know? The combat in Fractured But Whole changed to a strategy-based system due to input from South Park creators Matt Stone and Trey Parker. Matt and Trey wanted to keep the turn-based combat from Stick of Truth, but also wanted players to fight in the same place they were exploring rather than switch to a generic battle area. However, testing this idea led to some minor disorientation for players. Since the backgrounds were the same ones used to explore the world, players also expected to be able to move around the screen while fighting. The team tried adding movement, which essentially changed the combat into a tactic style. When development began on a Stick of Truth sequel, Parker and Stone wanted to continue the story of the game's player-created main character, The New Kid. Specifically, they wanted to build on The New Kid's farting abilities and thought about making farts a key element of the story and a means of time travel. Because of this, the original working title for the game was South Park The Butthole of Time. When Parker told this to the higher-ups at Ubisoft, however, the duo were advised to change the title, since Ubisoft warned that major retailers like Target and Walmart would refuse to sell a game with the word butthole in the title. In response, Parker sat at his desk and spent several hours trying to think of how they could somehow sneak the word butthole into the title of the game. Eventually, he came up with the final title for the game, South Park The Fractured Butthole. The development process of the game proved to be very different from its predecessor. After their experience with the Stick of Truth, Parker and Stone wanted a more active role in the production of The Fractured Butthole. Parker even spent some time watching PewDiePie's videos of the Stick of Truth and took notes on what parts of the game were funny and what parts needed more work. The Fractured But Whole also benefited greatly by moving to Ubisoft's proprietary Snowdrop engine, which was used for games like Tom Clancy's The Division and Mario Plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle. The main advantage of this engine was that it allowed the South Park team to import assets directly from the show, which uses Maya into the game. This eased the work of the game's designers, but it also allowed production of the game to mirror the production process of the show, which is notorious for being extremely fast-paced and featuring multitudes of last-minute changes. As a result, the script for The Fractured Butthole was able to stay topical and relevant, satirising things that happened only a couple of months before the game's release. The script for the game was massive, with the final draft weighing in at 360 pages with over 30,000 lines of dialogue, making it almost twice as large as the script for The Stick of Truth and about three or four times longer than the average Hollywood movie script. However, the same collaborative process that helped ease the game's development also ended up causing some problems for the team. Recording the characters' voices was left until near the end of development, and the majority of the characters were voiced by Parker and Stone themselves. With only days of production left and 10,000 lines yet to be recorded, Parker suddenly fell ill and had to undergo emergency surgery to remove his gallbladder, leaving him hospitalised. Parker managed to convince his doctor to give him temporary leave from the hospital so he could finish recording. When executive producer of South Park, Frank Agnone, saw how exhausted Parker was, he advised him to return to the hospital. Parker told Agnone, I just want this game to be sweet. After initially setting a release date of December 2016, the fractured but whole was delayed to early 2017. To compensate, Ubisoft announced that anyone who pre-ordered the game would also be able to download The Stick of Truth for free. The Fractured But Whole finally released in October 2017, a few days after the airing of the South Park episode, which served as a prologue to the events of the game's story. Like The Stick of Truth, The Fractured But Whole features a character creator that lets players customise the appearance of the new kid. However, it also added several new options, such as choices for the new kid's race and gender. This race option drew some attention prior to the game's release due to it jokingly being labelled as a difficulty setting. When asked about the feature by Eurogamer, Ubisoft representatives explained that the setting only affects the amount of money the player earns during the game, as well as how other characters speak to the new kid. The gender option also creates a potential retcon for the game's storyline. While the new kid in the fractured butthole is established to be the same character in The Stick of Truth, there was no option to play as a female character in the first game. Picking the female option in the fractured butthole causes the school's counsellor, Mr Mackey, to call the new kid's parents in confusion as to whether they were actually a girl this whole time during the events of The Stick of Truth. Cool Girl will also claim that she knew the player was a girl since their alter egos met in The Stick of Truth, even though the option to play as a girl in the first game didn't exist. Speaking of Cool Girl, her second normal ability, Phone Destroyer, references another game. It's a nod to the mobile game South Park Phone Destroyer, which actually released after Fractured But Whole. Although many small details of the game were changed between the game's reveal and the final build, one possible change stands out the most. There's unused code in the game implying that Timmy's alter ego, Dr. Timothy, was planned to be a playable character at some point. There's even an unused character sheet for the alter ego which lists his kryptonite as stairs. The game also has many interesting secrets and easter eggs. During the opening of the fractured butthole, if the player attempts to skip the intro cutscene, Cartman will refuse them, telling the player that they need to watch it. Eventually, if the player keeps attempting to skip the cutscene, 
cutscene, Cartman will angrily agree to skip it, but skip straight to the end credits to spite the player. A similar easter egg can be found early on when the new kid visits Cartman's house and needs to get into the locked basement. Normally, the player needs to go upstairs and read Cartman's diary to find the password to the door. If the player instead goes straight to the basement door and enters the correct password, Cartman will appear in the corner of the screen dressed as the New England Patriots coach Bill Belichick and berate the player for attempting to cheat. This is a reference to past allegations of cheating against Belichick and the Patriots quarterback Tom Brady. Another easter egg can be found after obtaining the Time Fart ability and travelling to the northeast corner of the world map. The player will find a path leading north blocked by an old man. By luring him to one side and freezing time, the player can push a basket of berries to block his path and then sneak by and go north to find some hidden collectibles on the way to a lone gas station. The music changes to a retro version of the song Blame Canada from the South Park movie as the player finds that the Canadian border has been walled off. There's also a secret boss hidden in the game. Visiting Freeman's tacos and attacking Morgan Freeman three times will cause him to attack the new kid, triggering a boss fight, and is one of, if not the most difficult boss in the game. Did you know? The very first Ninja Turtles game for the NES was also the first Ninja Turtles content to reach Japan. Despite the franchise having not reached the Japanese market yet, Konami published it in Japan before anywhere else. However, it was treated like an entirely different property and went under the name Geki Kame Ninja Den or Fierce Turtle Ninja Legend. Due to a lack of brand recognition, the game didn't perform as well as in other regions. The Japanese game generally stayed true to the Turtles story, with the only big change being that April O'Neil was rewritten as Master Splinter's daughter. When Konami started work on the game, the series was still in its infancy. The team used the comics and a brief overview of the upcoming cartoon as reference material, resulting in the game being a hybrid of sorts. The game's box art was recycled from the second print of Turtles issue number four. The cover has all four turtles wearing red masks as they do in the comic, but they all have different colored masks in the game itself. The inconsistency led some fans to believe this was a printing error. Released during the height of Turtle Mania, the game sold over four million copies and became one of the NES's best-selling titles. The title also appeared on Nintendo's Play Choice 10 arcade cabinet and was awarded Game of the Year in Nintendo Power magazine. It even helped strengthen the Nintendo brand in PAL regions, which was previously struggling to gain traction. Coming in a bundle with the NES called the Mutant Machine, it boosted console sales 2,000% in Christmas of 1990. According to former marketing director of Nintendo UK, Mike Hayes, the bundle was done against the wishes of Nintendo of America, possibly due to the game being a third third-party license title. The franchise also went under the name Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles in Britain at the time, due to the word ninja being deemed too violent for a children's property. Ninja Turtles was also the first licensed game to make its way to the Wii's virtual console service, but was taken down in 2012 due to the license expiring. It also cost 100 points more than the service's default NES asking price, likely to cover license fees. With the game's triumph on NES, several ports were made to capitalize on the Turtles craze. Rights to a home console version were exclusive to Nintendo. Nintendo, though several PC ports were made for PAL regions to coincide with the home release. In total, nine PC ports were put out in 1990. The DOS version in particular is known for being hastily put together and is even more difficult than its NES counterpart. It also has an infamous roadblock in one of the sewer segments, essentially rendering the game unbeatable. A gap that can be easily crossed in the NES game was made larger in the DOS version and the ceiling was lowered. There's no way to pass this level without cheating, though it was fixed up in the PAL release. Shortly after the NES game was published, the Turtles arcade game came out and was a universal hit. The title helped set the standard for beat-em-up games, and its success allowed Konami to develop several other licensed titles, most notably the Simpsons arcade game. The Turtles arcade game took much more inspiration from the cartoon, though the level featuring April's apartment is a direct reference to issue 10 of the comic. This scene would also be featured in the first movie, which drew heavily from the original source. The NES port of the arcade game came out nearly a year after the initial release, in which time the Turtles film had become a blockbuster. Given the subtitle Ninja Turtles 2, the port was advertised as a follow-up to the film, with the manual mentioning Shredder's defeat at the hands of the Turtles and how he eventually resurfaced. Though the game was downgraded for the NES, Konami compensated by adding new music and levels not present in the arcade game. It also included all new characters who haven't appeared in any other Turtle media, two of which were designed by Turtles co-creator Kevin Eastman. The title also had a tie-in campaign with Pizza Hut in North America 
and would include a coupon for a free pan pizza with each game. It also had in-game product placement featuring Pizza Hut's logo, which was removed in future ports and omitted from the Japanese release. This port was also made easier for Japanese players and had less enemies on screen as well as easier cheat code inputs. The game was also simply called TMNT, giving the franchise a proper introduction to the region. And when the third Turtles game, The Manhattan Project, was released in Japan, it went by the name TMNT 2. Like the first game, Manhattan Project's North American box art was done by Turtles comic artist Michael Dooney, though this time it was tailor-made for the game. Dooney wasn't aware of the game's contents and was only given a brief description of the plot. As a result, the artwork features characters that don't appear in the game, such as Casey Jones and the Triceratons. The game never saw a release in PAL regions despite heavy promotion and receiving a summer release date. This was possibly because the NES was getting old and the Super Nintendo had come out that same year. This caused some confusion when Ninja Turtles 4 Turtles in Time made its way to PAL regions as the series had skipped an entire game. Though Manhattan Project was overshadowed, it was still very well received. The soundtrack was a particular standout and was a huge influence on video game composer Jake Kaufman of Shovel Knight fame. Kaufman even cited it as one of the main reasons he pursued a career in composing. Kaufman also said he always wanted to compose for a Ninja Turtles game, and in 2014 he did the soundtrack for Danger of the Ooze, being one of his last projects at Way Forward. Ninja Turtles Tournament Fighters released on all three mainline consoles of the time, with each version sporting unique content. The game also marked the first non-comic appearance of Karai and featured two original characters, the more notable of which being Asuka. Fans believed Asuka was made to appeal more to a Japanese audience, but her name was revealed to be Mitsu in a prototype build of the game. This name was shared with a character from the third Turtles movie, which released earlier the same year. Since the third film was critically panned, it seems her name was changed as to not associate her with the film. Asuka Asuka also has different sprites in the Japanese version of the game, wearing skimpier clothing as well as having breast physics. Each release of Tournament Fighters features a different turtle on the box art, though since there was no fourth version, Michelangelo was left out. Interestingly, the Game Boy title Radical Rescue, which came out the same time as Tournament Fighters, features Michelangelo as the prominent turtle. Tournament Fighters was also the last Turtles game to be made for the NES, and was Konami's last game for the system. It even saw a release in Europe, despite the Manhattan Project being skipped over in the region two years prior. Stranger still, Japan didn't see an NES release of Tournament Fighters at all. In this episode, we'll be looking at games based on animated series, both Western and Eastern too. And what better way to start the trivia than by making our first fact a JoJo reference. One of Shonen Jump's more popular classics, Naruto, has had many video game adaptations. The PlayStation 2 fighting game, Naruto Shippuden Ultimate Ninja 4, contains a subtle yet undeniable JoJo reference. When playing as Shikamaru Nara, if the player uses his Shadow Possession Jutsu, Shikamaru will force the player into Jonathan Joestar's iconic pose. Perhaps unsurprisingly, this isn't the only time a Naruto game has referenced another anime. In Naruto Shippuden Ultimate Ninja Storm 2, when Naruto is about to finish off Pain with the Rasengan, Naruto can be seen with the image of the currently dead Jiraiya behind him, also performing the Rasengan. This bears a strong resemblance to the Gohan and currently deceased Goku's father-son Kamehameha from Dragon Ball Z during the Cell games. Naruto also does the same thing in Naruto Shippuden Ultimate Ninja Storm 3, when he's wearing Goku's costume and performs his ultimate jutsu finish chants. Speaking of Dragon Ball, there's an interesting secret in one of the franchise's Game Boy Advance titles, Dragon Ball Z Boo's Fury. While the game focuses on the Boo portion of the Dragon Ball story, it was apparently set to include a non-canonical story from the Dragon Ball Z animated movies. Within the game's data, near Android 18 Scouter entry are unused Scouter entries for the villains of the series' seventh movie, Dragon Ball Z Super Android 13. Entries for Androids 13, 14, and 15 all read, an evil android created by Dr. Gero's computer. There is also an entry for Super Android 13 which reads, After absorbing the broken parts of androids number 14 and number 15, number 13 transformed into this Super Android. This inclusion seems to imply that the developers at Webfoot plan to include the storyline as some sort of side quest. And while we're on the subject of Boo's Fury, the game has a sly reference to some of the series' localization differences. When Goku gives a demonstration of Super Saiyan to Majin Boo and Babidi, Boo says, Super Saiyajin? This is a reference to the Japanese name and pronunciation of Saiyans, which is Saiyajin. <laughs> 
Another popular show with a beloved video game adaptation is Harvey Birdman Attorney at Law. Pitched as a sort of Phoenix Wright for the world of animated icons, Harvey Birdman was developed for the PS2, PSP and Wii by High Voltage Software and Ace Attorney's Capcom, and as such includes several references to Capcom's catalogue. Several members of the Street Fighter cast can be found throughout Harvey Birdman's legal journey, such as a moment in which he accidentally sets Guile's hairdo ablaze, and the appearance of a peacock on the front of a magazine, in reference to T. Hawk. Dalsim also appears when it's revealed that the legal office is going zen and removing its furniture. Zangief intimidates the lawyer after he claims that Dum Dum is scheming an evil plan, and Ryu's portrait can even be seen on a fake ID card belonging to Peanut with the name Nobuyuki Johnson. Chun Li also attends Harvey's retirement party as a guest, and lastly, copies of Street Fighter 3 are also mentioned, with an SNES version being destroyed by Avenger. It's also found on Harvey's computer and as an arcade machine. Influenced by Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link, with its overhead world view and side-scrolling levels, it has another Zelda reference. If the player heads to the first dungeon without a sword, Jake will say, Hey man, it's dangerous to go alone. And then Finn will reply, What, we're both here? Jake then proceeds to say, Nah dude, what I mean is, this place is dangerous to enter without finding a sword first. I'm sure you'll find her soon. This is a direct reference to the classic phrase from the original Legend of Zelda, in which an old man will give Link his sword saying, It's dangerous to go alone, take this. This isn't the only reference to classic dialogue, as in the third dungeon, the Ice King will cut off a conversation with Finn saying, But enough talk, have at you. After this encounter, if the player examines the garbage princess, Jake will remark, A miserable little pile of trash. All of this references the first battle with Dracula in the prologue of Castlevania's Symphony of the Night, in which Dracula proclaims, What is a man? A miserable little pile of secrets! But enough talk! How about you? Alternatively, Adventure Time Explore the Dungeon Because I Don't Know had something deemed not appropriate for the Europeans. When encountering the Flame Princess for the first time, she'll accuse Princess Bubblegum of capturing her, saying, You tried to destroy me, you tart! This attack was only fully present in the US version of the game, with Flame Princess being cut off by Lumpy Space Princess's next line in Europe, before she says tart. You tried to destroy me, you- Oh my god! Princess, you should slap Princess Bubblegum in the face! This is because the word tart is commonly used as slang for a promiscuous woman or prostitute in Britain. Next up, we're looking at Darkwing Duck. Capcom had made a Darkwing Duck adaptation for the NES back in the late 80s, garnering a favourable response and helping solidify the company's child-friendly cast of characters with a spot in the video game industry. However, there is some unfortunate news attached to Darkwing Duck. Head Cannon, led by Simon Stealth Tomley, had attempted to bring the Darkwing Duck franchise back into the gaming limelight. After their success creating Sonic Mania, Stealth had an encounter with some members of Capcom during an E3 event. They expressed an interest in the idea of bringing the series back, which Stealth said he'd been wanting to create for some time already. With this info, Headcanon quickly worked to make a tech demo for a possible reboot of Darkwing Duck, going on to make a fully functioning concept demo for a single level. While they had initially seen interest from Capcom, it quickly began to disappear, as the company's communication passed from one member of staff to another, before responses dried up entirely. The company had spent a few months creating this demo, perhaps foolishly, considering the lack of contract or firm confirmation of interest by Disney XX, only to find that their work was for nothing. Tom Lee later said that he was told by a credible source that Disney wouldn't have been interested in the project at the time, so nothing would happen. Headcanon found itself in a tough spot and tried to shift gears on their work so that the efforts they'd put into the pitch weren't entirely in vain. This involved trying to change the game's aesthetic and characters to be based on an original IP known as Vertebreaker, with several new members of staff being brought in, including a friend of this channel to work as the game's lead artist, A Plus Start, and Matthew Weeks, one of the artists on the modern Sega Genesis title, Tanglewood. Sadly, after launching a Kickstarter campaign, the team wasn't able to gather enough funds to sustain themselves during a long development period, and as such, the project was cancelled. Tom Lee wouldn't be able to keep his head above water during development without proper funding, and his work on Sonic Mania was only based on development milestones rather than royalties based on its success. 
His financial situation wasn't as favourable as many would have you believe, leaving him without the necessary finances to support himself or his team for the game's development. And now it's time for this episode's random piece of trivia, and today we'll be taking a look at David Cage's interactive action adventure, Beyond Two Souls. In a bid to drum up some excitement around the release of their upcoming game, Quantic Dream sent out mock scripts of Beyond Two Souls to numerous video game media outlets as if the game's starring Oscar nominee Ellen Page wasn't enough. The scripts themselves were a monstrous 2,000 pages, almost all of which were entirely blank. Supposedly, this was representative of the size of the actual script for the game. Besides the cover, the only writing to be found is on the first page, which reads, the average film script is 100 pages. At 2,000 pages, this is not your average film script. Beyond Two Souls, the first exclusive PlayStation title to be officially selected for the Tribeca Film Festival. Along with these paper monuments, the developers sent out DVDs featuring one minute of Beyond's one and a half hour screening at Tribeca Film Festival. Anime and gaming seem to go practically hand in hand. The animated stylings of anime appear to translate well from clean, hand-drawn artwork to the crisp 2D sprites of video games. Many of the stories featured in video games have also been influenced by Japanese culture, and since Japan is the home of anime and manga, the two mediums often have overlapping tropes. It's like one of my Japanese animes. Both mediums also became popular in the West around the same time, which is no doubt due to their similarities and ties to Japanese culture. We're starting off with our dive into anime games with the popular 90s and 2000s series Yu-Gi-Oh! This franchise had over a dozen games on just the Game Boy Advance alone, so we'll just jump right into the middle of the system's offerings with a game whose name is almost comically long, Yu-Gi-Oh!'s Seven Trials to Glory World Championship Tournament 2005. In the game's Shadow World, there is an area where a duelist can be found hiding inside a cardboard box. If the player talks to them, they'll say, I don't know why I'm revealing this, but I'm a secret spy. I was hired by an organization which shall remain nameless in order to study this Shadow World. It's believed to be a reference to Solid Snake from Konami's Metal Gear series. Not only does the character hide in a box while doing espionage like Snake and work for a secret organization, but many Yu-Gi-Oh games, Seven Trials to Glory included, were made by Konami, strengthening this connection. Moving on to an incredibly well-respected manga and anime series which has also seen its fair share of video games, let's talk about Lupin the Third. Although most Lupin games never leave Japan, a few of the titles have traveled beyond the Isles. One example of this is Lupin the Third, Lupin is Dead, Zenigata is in Love, which also saw release in Europe. However, a very limited release in Europe, so limited in fact, that it was actually only available in a single European country. In February 2008, an entire year after the game's Japan release, the game found its way to Italy courtesy of Italian publisher 505 Games. Another Lupin game, Lupin the Third Treasure of the Sorcerer King, had a much more expansive release, but again not in Europe. The only European country the game was officially released in was once again Italy via 505 Games. Another well-respected and highly beloved anime and manga series is JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, which has seen several video game adaptations. When Capcom was working on an arcade fighting game based on the franchise, the team wanted to include the character of Midler as a playable character. At the time, however, the character's full appearance had never been shown officially. The character appears in the 1993 JoJo RPG on the Super Famicom as a stewardess, though not using an official design, and only two panels in the manga show the character from the waist down. This fighting game was intended to be a faithful adaptation of the original source material, or at least as close as possible. Thus, the development team decided to forego the JoJo RPG design and asked Hirohiko Araki, the manga's original author, to redesign her specifically for the game, turning her into something akin to a belly dancer with her face covered up. After the game's release, Midler would appear in the official Jojo Agogo art book, suggesting that the redesigned appearance had become part of the Jojo canon. While we're on the subject of fighting games, J-Star's Victory Versus is a crossover title featuring franchises tied to the weekly Shonen Jump manga. The game features some very prominent anime and manga series such as Naruto, One Piece, Fist of the North Star, Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, and Dragon Ball. And as you might expect, it features characters and locations from these franchises, some of which have some fairly sneaky easter eggs. 
For example, if the player goes to the Planet Namek stage and goes to the bottom of the lake, they can find the four-star Dragon Ball underwater. This is likely a reference to a part of the Namek arc in Dragon Ball Z, where in one chapter, Vegeta throws the four-star Dragon Ball into the water for safekeeping after wiping out everyone at a Namekian village. Speaking of Dragon Ball, the franchise may have had a large impact on a certain Japanese video game company. While Sonic would eventually take over as Sega's golden boy, it was Alex Kidd that Sega used as their unofficial mascot through the 80s. Miracle World was critically acclaimed upon release, earning high praise for its tight platforming and visual likeness that gave Sega fans a Super Mario-like experience outside of Nintendo. However, despite the long-running suspicions that Alex Kidd had been deliberately positioned to rival the world's most famous plumber, theories persisted that Sega hadn't initially set out to make a Mario clone at all. Some speculate that Alex Kidd was in fact a Dragon Ball tie-in that had to be hastily reworked due to licensing conflicts. Miracle World designer Kotaro Hayashida would go on to confirm this theory to John Shapiniak in February of 2018. By Hayashida's own admission, Alex's primary weapon had originally been the Nyoibo, a mystical staff used by Dragon Ball's Son Goku, to whom Alex Kidd bears an uncanny resemblance a boy with monkey-like features wearing an orange gi and blue boots. The resemblance doesn't stop there. Players will find a rice ball in the end of each stage, which Alex Kidd must eat before progressing, and each loading screen features a sprite of him happily munching down between stages. When quizzed on this detail in 2002, Hayashida couldn't place where Alex's love of onigiri came from, but given that there are countless scenes of Goku scoffing rice balls in a similar manner in Dragon Ball, we're willing to bet we know the real answer there. In later versions of the game, these rice balls were replaced with burgers. Goku and his grandpa also use an attack called Janken several times throughout Dragon Ball. This is an attack that incorporates a game of rock, paper, scissors to first confuse the enemy, and then strikes when they least expect it. Alex Kidd's boss battles play out in a surprisingly similar fashion. Instead of dialing up mechanics of regular stages like most other games, boss challenges are boiled down to a game of rock, paper, scissors, known in Miracle World as, wait for it, Janken. Hayashida recalled playtester reactions to this design decision, the majority of which were outraged that all progress could be lost in a game of chance. Despite all the negative feedback, he still refused to scrap it. When asked what a remake of Alex Kidd would look like, Hayashida shared his wish for something more along the lines of Shaolin Soccer, particularly telling considering the influence of Dragon Ball is present through the entirety of director Stephen Chow's work. Nevertheless, despite Hayashida's clear passion for a Dragon Ball project, the license would later go to Bandai, leaving Alex Kidd and Dragon Ball fans alike to wonder what might have been if the team hadn't been forced to refocus their efforts. Did you know, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure first received a video game adaptation of the manga in early 1993, months before the series was even adapted to anime. Production of the Super Famicom game was overseen by Shinji Hashimoto, who is now the Final Fantasy brand manager at Square Enix. Developed by Winkysoft, the game is an RPG based on the third story arc, Stardust Crusaders, with some minor deviations. The game is presented similarly to point-and-click adventures while navigating the world, and has unique mechanics such as a biorhythm system, which alters character stats as they become stressed. Before a battle, the player must also select a card which will change the character's abilities, and battles follow typical turn-based RPG rules. This would be the only time that JoJo appeared as an RPG, as after this, JoJo games were mostly fighters. The first JoJo fighting game was developed by Capcom for the arcade in 1998, and was also based on the Stardust Crusaders arc. JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, Heritage of the Future, is an enhanced re-release of the arcade game, which was ported to the PlayStation and Dreamcast in 1998. Heritage was the last game to use Capcom's CPS3 arcade boards, before the company began using Sega's Naomi boards, which had very similar hardware to the Dreamcast. The CPS3 boards were an attempt by Capcom to run multiple games on one board, instead of the standard one game to one board, which would, in theory, save money. The next JoJo game released was GeoGeo's Bizarre Adventure, which launched on the PlayStation 2 in Japan. It was scheduled for one 
worldwide release. However, despite making an appearance at E3, nothing was ever brought to the West. The reason for the cancellation was unknown, but it's speculated that there were copyright issues halting localization. This was also the last JoJo game by Capcom before the rights were picked up by Bandai, now Bandai Namco. The first game under this new rights holder was the Japan exclusive JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Phantom Blood, developed by Anchor Inc. This was followed by JoJo's Bizarre Adventure All-Star Battle several years later under a different developer, CyberConnect2. All-Star Battle producer Hiroshi Matsuyama explained that All-Star Battle was conceived partly thanks to the previous JoJo game Phantom Blood. When that game was finished, Matsuyama's team came up with the idea of a new game involving all the story arcs of the series. This means that All-Star Battle was conceived up to seven years before its release. All-Star Battle also has several accolades. The game received a perfect score from Japan's famous Famitsu magazine, making JoJo All-Star Battle the only licensed video game to receive a perfect score from Famitsu. The game's special edition also sold out in just 20 minutes after ordering went live on Amazon. To promote the release of All-Star Battle, CyberConnect2, Namco Bandai, and Lucky Land Communications organized the All-Star Battle League contest. The competition started on July 3rd and went on to August 28th and featured computer-controlled characters competing against each other. The event consisted of seven groups which contained four to five characters in each. Three characters had the chance to be skipped straight to the final. This was through a cheer campaign in which fans could vote for their favorite characters via a Twitter link located on the website. The results of the cheer campaign put Dio, Jonathan Joestar, and Josuke Higashikata to the final round. The event was shown over a series of live streams promoting the upcoming game. After three final rounds, Jotaro Kujo and Dio fought in the final, with Dio winning. A unique PlayStation 3 theme was released to commemorate his victory. The contest was repeated for the next JoJo game, Eyes of Heaven, and was called the Eyes of Heaven Tournament. Capcom have often referenced JoJo in their titles, with some games having multiple nods within them. In a Famitsu interview with Street Fighter II producer Noritaka Funamizu, Funamizu stated that Guile was modeled after the JoJo character Jean-Pierre Polnareff, particularly his hair. Noritaka also mentioned how Guile's name was derived from Jay Guile, who Polnareff hunts down to avenge his little sister. The book Street Fighter Cross Tekken Artworks also mentions that when Guile's sprites were being drawn, the artist stretched out Guile's hair at the top as a joke, and the change stuck. Another Street Fighter 2 character references Jojo. According to a Polygon feature, Street Fighter 2 designer Akira Nishitani states that the idea for Dal Sim's extendable limbs actually came from Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. Specifically, the idea seems to be based on the Zoom Punch attack, which dislocates and stretches the user's arms. Capcom have continued their appreciation of Jojo, even with more modern franchises like Monster Hunter. In 2012, Capcom announced that two pieces of equipment based on JoJo would be coming to Monster Hunter 3G in the form of DLC. After the update dropped, players could craft a mask based on Harvest, as well as a hammer based on Crazy Diamond. A key developer at Capcom is behind many of the company's JoJo references. Hideki Kamiya seems to be a fan of the series, and has stuck many easter eggs into his creations. Kamiya used his influence to name the Stars member Joseph Frost after the JoJo character Joseph Joestar. Kamiya would go on to direct Resident Evil 2, which has another JoJo reference. At the police station in Scenario A, the player meets Marvin Branner. A tag on the locker behind Marvin reads JoJo. After this trivia was mentioned in an early episode of Did You Know Gaming Extra, Kamiya confirmed that this was in fact also a reference to JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, and could even be a reference to Capcom's own JoJo's Bizarre Adventure fighting game, which came out the same year as Resident Evil 2. There's another possible JoJo reference within a Kamiya game. Devil May Cry has a type of enemy called a Nobody. It's been pointed out by fans that the faces of the Nobodies resemble the stone masks from Jojo. One fan asked Kamiya over Twitter whose idea it was to reference Jojo, and Kamiya implied it was intentional. Kamiya would continue to reference Jojo in his games after leaving Capcom. In Bayonetta, if the player acquires the Infernal Communicator at the Gates of Hell, they'll be able to summon Infernal Demons, known as the Little Devils. The Little Devils are a subtle Jojo reference, alluding 
to Guido Mista's Sex Pistols. The Sex Pistols are six small creatures, numbered 1 through 7, skipping over number 4. Specifically, the five little devils are numbered 1 through 6, skipping over number 2. Both sets of creatures also have their designated numbers engraved on their foreheads. Although many video games have JoJo-related Easter eggs, JoJo games have many references themselves. In JoJo's Bizarre Adventure for Arcades, Iggy's second special seems to reference Akuma's Shun Goku Satsu Super Combo from Street Fighter. As well as having a similar animation, the game contains an unused sprite with the kanji Inu on it, which means dog. This was meant to parody the kanji that appears during Akuma's combo. In the English version of All-Star Battle, if Joseph Joestar goes up against Lisa Lisa and wins, he'll say, Why did it have to come to this? You are tearing me apart, Lisa Lisa. This is a reference to the cult classic terror bad movie, The Room, where Tommy Wiseau's character shouts, You are tearing me apart, Lisa. Games adapted from popular anime and manga aren't regularly translated and brought over to the West. This typically happens when a series isn't popular outside of Japan, but sometimes a lack of popularity clearly isn't the case. When an anime becomes popular in the USA, its games will often be localized as well, but one cult anime has two games to its name which the West never saw. That series is Cowboy Bebop. Cowboy Bebop is an anime that follows a crew of space bounty hunters. The group often get themselves into unpredictable situations, leading to some interesting takes on a spacefaring future. The series' first adaptation into a video game was produced by Bandai and was released for the original PlayStation in 1998, which is fitting as the PlayStation makes a cameo appearance in the series. The game allows you to take control of protagonist Spike Spiegel as he flies his spaceship, the Swordfish 2. The title uses a third-person perspective and has the player chase down bounties through various levels. Each location is set on rails and puts you up against an assortment of enemies along the way. At the end of each track, the player must fight a boss before collecting their reward, and bonus points can be spent between stages on upgrading the ship's weapons. Throughout the game, characters from the show will provide the player with information and tips. The cast are all voiced by their original Japanese voice actors, and the game's soundtrack was even composed by the anime's original composer, Yoko Kano. Needless to say, the game was inspired by Nintendo's Star Fox series. The title wasn't particularly well received, with many critics citing the game's lack of real flight controls and poor graphics. There's also a total of just six levels, making the game very short. During our play of the game, we also felt it lacked the essence of Cowboy Bebop. Throughout the anime, Spike is shown to be foolhardy, but knows when to flee when things get too dangerous. The game pits you up against thousands of ships that are eliminated with ease, a situation that wouldn't take place in the anime. Spike never retorts back to his crew during levels, only during cutscenes, making his personality seem lost during gameplay. It would be seven years before another Cowboy Bebop game hit the market, once again never leaving Japan. Translated as Cowboy Bebop Serenade of Reminiscence, the next game was created by Bandai subsidiary Ban Presto. Released in 2005, the Cowboy Bebop world could now be explored as a number of different playable characters in the form of a beat-em-up brawler. The game's developers decided to create an original story exclusively for the title. While the crew are seeking out the overabundance of outlaws with bounties on their heads, the team learn about the existence of a treasure lost by the famous space pirate Captain H. The captain would steal from the rich and give to the poor, similar to Robin Hood. Spike and Jet have little interest in the treasure and think it'd be impossible to find, and so Faye seeks it out on her own. Meanwhile, Spike meets a wanted music producer who tells him of an unpublished pop song by famous singer Priscilla that was lost to the ages. Another of Priscilla's tracks, the 50-year-old record Diamonds, has made a resurgence in popularity and seems to be played almost everywhere the crew goes. The Lost song, titled Pearls, is said to be a song to complement Diamonds. Spike decides to seek out the Lost song, only to find the track is linked to the Lost treasure in its own way. While Jet is out trying to cash in bounties to fund ship repairs, he encounters the widow of a friend from his policing days at the ISSP. Curious to learn more of his death, Jet decides to investigate the case further. All the while, two rookie bounties bounty hunters, Bianca and Kent, get mixed up with the crew. Faye takes an interest in Kent after learning that he's a descendant of Captain H, and so she hopes that he'll be able to lead her to the treasure. During their hunt, gangs are out to stop the team from taking their wanted leaders, and another organization seems eager to find the mysterious treasure before anybody else. Similar to many episodes of Cowboy Bebop, there are a number of twists along the way. Each of the characters' stories are intertwined, and we're even given more background to the characters. 
The game is a mix of several different genres. The game's main focus is on beat-em-up style brawling. The player can combine punches and kicks and use a range of objects to defeat thugs. Intertwined with these fights are gunplay segments that let the player perform bullet time inspired moves. Throughout stages, the player may also need to perform small portions of investigation to find clues, such as hints towards key codes for locks. A few other gameplay elements are thrown into the mix, such as the player running from danger or piloting a spacecraft. The game also features a stealth based level and a boat driving segment. Each style of gameplay was reviewed fairly poorly, with critics citing issues such as lackluster controls and a reliance on tedious memorization. One part of the game which was widely praised, however, is the segment where Jet can explore the Bebop. This allowed fans to explore the ship seen throughout the anime. The game manages to portray the overall feeling of the anime series, which is what the original PS1 title lacked. It stays true to the style of the show, only compromising in a few places to suit the gameplay. Several shots throughout the game also pay homage to the original animation. The soundtrack is mostly comprised of tracks taken from the anime series, though three new tracks were created for the game. These tracks would later appear on the final soundtrack for the series titled Cowboy Bebop Tank The Best. The first Cowboy Bebop title on the PlayStation 1 was probably never considered for an international release. In 1998, the anime was yet to become a cult hit in America. However, in 2004, reports online stated that Cowboy Bebop Serenade of Reminiscence was set for an international release. The game was demoed at E3 and was generally well received. Bebop was regularly aired on Adult Swim in the USA at the time, allowing for the series to garner a massive following. However, in 2004, Bandai updated the game's official English website to change the shipping date from full 2004 to fall 2005, and at the end of 2005, updated it once more to remove the date altogether. How much of the game was localized before its cancellation remains a mystery. We attempted to contact several voice actors who worked on Bebop to see if Bandai ever approached them to work on the game, but we received no response. Because the game was set to release in 2005, Bandai might have thought it was a better investment to pursue titles for the upcoming PlayStation 3 rather than release games for the soon to be out of date PS2. It's also possible that Bandai saw the game's lukewarm critical reception in the West and decided against publishing a product that had already been labelled as subpar. This would be unusual, however, as the quality of licensed games is usually quite low. Did you know? The Xbox version of Shrek was completed in less than a year, and according to the game's credits, the project was done over the course of 10 lucky months. The game was published by TDK Media Active and developed by DICE, who would later go on to develop the Battlefield series, Mirror's Edge, and the Star Wars Battlefront games. Shrek on the Xbox was the first commercial video game to use deferred shading, a technique that would later be seen in Battlefield 1942, developed by DICE a year later. With deferred shading, light is only calculated for the pixels it actually interacts with. This means multiple lights sources can be used at a lower cost than standard shading techniques, allowing for ambient light that more accurately imitates the Shrek movies. The Shrek game was more than just a simple tie-in, it was one of the titles made to get people to buy the Xbox brand. It was featured on the Xbox demo disc, as well as in brochures, contests, and playable kiosks. Microsoft showcased the game at investor meetings and trade events to show off the power of the Xbox, and was seen as one of the console's most visually impressive titles using advanced lighting and bump mapping textures. General manager for Microsoft's game division Jay Allard had this to say about Shrek's specs. People really respond to Shrek for the Xbox. Its humor, fast-paced quirky gameplay, and cinema-like graphics make it one of the groundbreaking Xbox launch titles. Shrek is a great example of how the Xbox allows us to draw images at the same level of quality of feature films. This will completely change the way that people view video games. Despite all this, other elements of the game were received poorly, especially its gameplay. The game was a timed exclusive for the Xbox, with a GameCube port releasing the following year titled Shrek Extra large, adding new content. Contrary to the port's box art, Donkey is still not anywhere in the game. Shrek had no spoken lines in the game either, even though it features a fair bit of voice acting. In an interview with IGN, TDK producer Nick Fox talked about Shrek's development. From the start, the team worked closely with PDI slash DreamWorks crew and talked with several important figures during the creative process, including the movie's directors. The game and movie teams frequently emailed each other throughout development, and the movie team helped out in any way they could. They scheduled meetings with the film's animators to work on the game's animation, and DreamWorks even provided the team with character and world models, though some models went unused due to software incompatibility. As noted on the game's box art, it featured characters designed by comic artist Todd McFarlane, best known for his work on The Amazing Spider-Man, co-creating Venom, and making the Spawn series. There were strong talks of TDK following up with a Shrek sequel, but those plans never came to pass, as the license went to Activision starting with Shrek 2. However, according to Nick Fox, TDK originally
originally had the Shrek license for five years, and even showed Shrek 2 as part of their E3 lineup in May 2003. TDK was acquired by Take-Two Interactive, and as a result, the Shrek rights were picked up by Activision. Though reviews of the Shrek 2 game were mixed, the popularity of the Shrek franchise proved to be great for Activision sales-wise. It, along with the Spider-Man 2 game, shipped over 5 million units combined, and at the time, made for Activision's highest first quarter revenues in the company's history. Where Spider-Man was the best-selling game of June 2004, Shrek 2 made for the best-seller earlier in May. In the US alone, the GBA version raked in over $18 million and $26 million on the PS2 by 2006, and combined console sales reached over 2.5 million units. Shrek has also dabbled in a few fighting games. Developed by the now-defunct Shaba Games, Shrek Super Slam took inspiration from many different fighters, as well as other genres like platformers and first-person shooters. It also found inspiration in films, from the Shrek series itself to Master of the Flying Guillotine and Kill Bill. Like many things Shrek-related, Super Slam became a source of internet ridicule, thanks to a group of friends making a joke that got a little out of hand. Having enjoyed competitive melee matches and Shrek memes, the group decided to combine the two after finding a copy of Super Slam lying around. They took the joke online and made a Reddit page for Super Slam. Laying dormant for over a year, Reddit user Snowball Eater flooded the page with posts about techniques and theories on the game, and others started taking notice, eventually getting the page over 1,000 followers. There's even a competitive scene for the game, including netplay tournaments and a website that keeps an up-to-date tier list for the playable characters. It's gotten to the point where people who worked on Super Slam have caught wind of the game's resurgence. One of the developers, Sylvan Dubrowski, said the Shaba team was working on an original title before Super Slam, but it was shelved by Activision. An outsourcing manager for Shaba, Paul Culp, talked about his disdain for the Shrek franchise. Culp said, I hated Shrek. Still do. I didn't give that game my best. The rest of the team could have easily phoned it in and moved on. But they didn't. I don't know how much you've paid attention to the art and animation in Super Slam, but it's all pretty great, especially for the time. Personally, I drank a lot during that time, but everyone deals with it in their own way. Despite his personal thoughts, hearing that people were still playing the game and enjoying it made him very happy. And when he told the other team members who worked on Super Slam, they were just as surprised as he was. As a game developer, the goal is to give people a good time. So the best thing ever is hearing people are having fun with your game over a decade later. The PS2 version of Super Slam also has an unused file called strident.bin in its data. This file is actually a full PSP game rip of Tony Hawk's Underground 2. The game likely found its way onto the disc due to both titles being developed by Shaba Games. It's common for developers to fill empty space on a disc with what's known as a dummy file, a file with no purpose other than taking up space on a disc or cartridge. Super Slam's disc size is 1.6 gigabytes, with Tony Hawk's taking up almost half of that file size. Comparing the retail release of Underground 2 with the version on the Shrek disc, there are slight differences and file sizes, and the build found in Super Slam was compiled two days after the retail version. The Shrek franchise also has several kart racers attached to it. Interestingly, Shrek Smash and Crash Racing for the Nintendo DS has an unused track from Mario Kart 64 in its data. The unused song is the main theme from Mario Kart 64, which was one of the samples Nintendo included with the DS's developmental kit. Did you know? Star Wars Battlefront 2 was originally a multiplayer exclusive title and had a mere one year development cycle. Partway through production, however, new executives joined LucasArts. They were worried that a multiplayer only title wouldn't sell and insisted that the game have a single player campaign. When the team explained that they couldn't do this with their current budget or timetable, they were told to just quote, figure it out. Battlefront 2's director nearly had a nervous breakdown towards the end of production, but the team successfully completed both modes on time. Battlefront 2 sold well, but a sequel to the game lingered in development for years. Eventually, LucasArts approached developer Free Radical to work on the title. Free Radical's vision for Battlefront 3 was ambitious and saw players transition seamlessly from ground warfare to space battles. They struggled for two years to try to get this title working. Development took so long that the art team began designing assets for a potential Battlefront 4 before 3 was even near completion. Despite these troubles, however, LucasArts thought highly of the game. One former LucasArts employee remembered, we we kept getting these code drops that were amazing. We thought Battlefront 3 was going to turn the industry on its head. Free Radical was meeting all of their milestones. Even LucasArts president Jim Ward would sit in these core meetings and would say things like, so this is shipping next month, right? However, Free Radical began hitting roadblocks and missing milestones in early 2008. Their design documents called for 100 player matches, but the game would slow down with just 20. The company cut the projected 100 players down to just 50 and greatly reduced the single 
single-player campaign in scope. Regardless, it became apparent to LucasArts that Free Radical wasn't going to make their projected release date for Battlefront 3. One former employee speculated, Internally, because this was right when Hayes was shipping, we were all certain that they had pulled tons of resources off Battlefront to finish up Hayes, and they wouldn't tell us what was going on. We tried to get our producers over there and they wouldn't let us into the building. The relationship just started fraying. Around this time, Daryl Rodriguez was appointed the president of LucasArts and began pushing Free Radical even harder. This further strained the relationship between the two companies. Free Radical Audio Director Graeme Norgate stated, LucasArts hadn't paid us for six months, and were refusing to pass a milestone so we'd limp along until the money finally ran out. They knew what they were doing. Eventually, LucasArts officially cut ties with Free Radical, and their vision for Battlefront 3 was scrapped. Free Radical co-founder Steve Ellis commented that the development on the title was 99% complete, and just needed bug fixing for release. Battlefront 3 wasn't the only Star Wars game that got stuck in development purgatory. Other games included a Call of Duty-style shooter called First Assault. There were also two different attempts to continue the Jedi Knight series titled Brink of Darkness and Jedi Master. Imperial Commando was a planned sequel to Republic Commando, and there was going to be a Knights of the Old Republic 3, though no one at LucasArts remembered why it was cancelled. A game that focused on Darth Maul titled Battle of the Sith Lords was in development at Redfly Studios in 2010. The project began as a collaboration collaboration between LucasArts and Nintendo to bring an exclusive series to Nintendo systems. Redfly envisioned the game as a stealth-oriented action title in the vein of the Arkham Asylum games, and wanted to focus on Maul's origin story. This iteration never made it past the conception phase, as LucasArts wanted the game to tie in with an upcoming Maul-centered storyline in the Clone Wars animated series. Eventually, Star Wars creator George Lucas became interested in the project and personally met with Redfly. Before the developers could even finish their pitch, however, Lucas interrupted them after noticing figurines of Maul and the extended universe character Darth Talon. One source told Game Informer, Lucas cut them off, stood up, walked over to the statues, rotated them to be facing the same direction, pushed them together, and said they're friends. He wanted these characters to be friends and to play off each other. When someone pointed out that Maul and Talon existed nearly 170 years apart from each other in the Star Wars canon, Lucas brushed the problem off and said the main character could just be a descendant or clone of Maul instead. Redfly struggled with the problem project for several months, creating prototypes for the game, but LucasArts refused to sign off on any of the team's larger ideas. Eventually, the publisher flew out several members of the Red Fly team to their campus in San Francisco for a boot camp on prototyping, hoping to give the project a clearer direction. Afterwards, progress on the title was made and the two companies grew very close. There were even rumors at the Red Fly offices that suggested LucasArts wanted to buy the company. However, in mid-2011, communication from LucasArts abruptly stopped. One an ex-Red Fly employee remembered, We didn't hear from them for two weeks. No word, nothing. And when I say no word, I mean nothing. We did manage to get some of the guys, the internal producers that were on our project on Skype, and they looked like they were kicked in the nuts. We knew what was going on, they just couldn't tell us. In June of 2011, the project was officially cancelled. No one at Red Fly was told why development ended, though several ex-staff members believe it relates to Lucas selling his company to Disney. During a Reddit AMA in October 2015, 15, CEO and creative director of Redfly Studio Dan Borth spoke about the cancelled Maul game. He stated that Redfly are attempting to resurrect the Darth Maul project, and are hoping to prototype a demo of the game to EA. 